we understand how crucial feature engineering is and you know what are the different aspects of it but let's let's extend this concept a little bit right now the initial uh, half an hour 40 minutes let's talk a little bit more about this aspect and what are the different ways you can uh, you can handle features what are the different things you can do with features right so in this discussion i'll talk about this uh, amazing library called automated you know uh, feature tools which will help you create and generate features automatically okay and also uh, we'll also look at <clears throat> uh, some aspects of how to handle outliers what are some of the things you can do for missing values so a little bit of discussion on that and from there a very important part of today's class will be uh, i'm going to take up a few case studies and we're going to look at multiple algorithms we're going to try to combine multiple algorithms together and we'll try to uh, give you a comparative comparison across multiple algorithms how to present them together and how to analyze which one is working well which one is not working well we're going to see all of that in one piece and finally uh, we'll also look at on the uh, uh, the, the main content part of today we look at something called clustering very interesting topic we look at clustering and we'll understand especially the unsupervised learning side of things how unsupervised learning works right so we're going to look at that and as a follow-up to supervised learning i've got another very interesting case study although text analytics is a huge topic and it's a massive subject in itself but i've got a few interesting demos planned out for you on how to do uh, text mining as well so we're going to see that as well uh, how to specifically approach text mining and what are some of the things to uh, we can we can do around that okay so with that let's go on and let's get a move on so uh, first of all what is this uh, automated feature engineering concept what, you know, what what is the what is the idea behind automated feature engineering the the basic idea is that you know uh, just to give you some background about what you know what this whole thing is and uh, you know what is the background behind this feature tools library <coughs> uh, so basically just to give you some background the the company behind this is called feature labs so the organization behind this whole thing is called uh, feature labs and this is pretty much uh, you know what we have right now you can see the organization is called feature labs and uh, they also have a nice github page where they talk about some of the work that they're doing and feature labs one very interesting uh, just to give you some update about it because recently acquired by alteryx last year <clears throat> so alteryx uh, acquired feature labs uh, last year and just to just goes to show how much of how much of uh, you know importance is placed in the feature engineering side of things because i think we've discussed this enough garbage in garbage out all these aspects you've talked about a lot i think it just goes to show how important uh, generating good quality features are and <laughs> i think data in, you know uh, domain knowledge and all is absolutely uh, crucial no doubt about that but generally speaking we are looking for techniques through which we can automatically create features and wouldn't it be amazing if i can have a uh, automated way of generating features that's pretty much what what feature tools gives us and the parent organization behind that is what we call feature labs so it's the parent organization behind that particular thing so uh, just to give you some background as to what feature tools actually does so feature tools in a way uh, you know i'm not going to get into the details around this thing but just to give you some use cases and ideas as to how it works uh, it kind of does a permutation and combination of different types of operations right it, it, it somehow does a permutation combination of different types of operations uh, so for example you've got a mean aggregation sum aggregation uh, skew aggregation median aggregation so there are so many different types of uh, transformation operations you can apply and what feature tools kind of does is it it it, it kind of does a permutation and combination of all these different operations and it starts creating features for you now we can of course argue that many of these features are kind of black box features that many of them do not mean anything many of them do not uh, convey anything in a very practical sense but uh, again having said that in a way you can still find some meaning behind these features so this is the powerful powerful thing so uh, without any further ado let's just quickly see a quick demo on this so what we have here on the screen we've got three simple tables all of you can take a look at it right now it's a quick demonstration of the capabilities of feature tools and, and feel free to use it it's not some it's not some science fiction that we are talking about and the company has clearly listed out projects that they're doing and they've clearly listed out that hey i mean it, it sounds like black box i mean anybody who you know like 
you would have heard me what i said like permutation combination of all possible operations and it feels like a black box it seems like a black box but unless you unless you actually see the proof and evidence that it works like it's hard to believe like i mean <laughs> that's so it, it, you know just to show you the kind of features it creates this is the kind of features it ends up creating you will look at it and say the sign this looks like a complete black box what is join month minus credit score by log income by minus credit score how do you even read that feature but this is exactly what feature tools does it's pretty incredible like just by creating features like this it's able to probably you know like uh, you're still able to create good quality features it's incredible how it actually works and it's proven it's proven across several data sets uh, so let's see <clears throat> this is a simple data set we have got uh, we have got clients we've got loans we've got payments clients give you customer level details so uh, think of it data coming from your crm and each row is a customer so each row is a client you've got information about when the customer joined your, uh, you know, uh, when the customer joined the payment account or whatever, uh, the loan account and how much income they have and how much uh, credit score they have. So uh, this is like customer level details. So you're giving an, getting an information about when the customer joined the bank. So they opened a bank account when they joined, how much is their credit score and uh, how much is their overall income. Next table or data frame is our uh, loans data frame. Uh, that's where we are keeping a track of loan level detail so the level of detail is very important so here you keep a track of loan level details and you basically tell tell the customers how much uh, <clears throat> each customer what kind of loans they have taken and that's the loan level of detail that we have okay so you can see uh, very interesting there can be repetition this is the one to many relationship you can all relate to it uh, so this is one customer can take many loans one customer map to multiple loans you can see probably we can find out one example here itself so it's four nine six two four <laughs> all of you please look at is 49624 and 49624 this is the same customer and they've taken multiple loans they map to multiple uh, loan ids you can see same customer but they've taken multiple loans loan start date loan end date at what rate you've taken the loan how much loan amount you've taken have you repaid yes no and finally loan type so bottom line is customer level of detail loan level of detail one to many relationship third table gives you information about payments that means against each loan how much payment you have made Again, if you look at relationship between loan to payments table, that's a one to many relationship. One loan can have multiple payments. Payments are like installments, like EMI, how much of the payments you're making per loan. Okay. So straightforward, there are three tables. Uh, so customer to loan, one to many relationship, and loan to payment, one to many relationship. Okay, that's what we have. Now in an, under normal circumstances, if I ask you to do feature engineering, how will you do it? You'll probably merge and join all the three tables and then try to uh, create domain-based features, try to figure out okay, what possible features we might want to create in this data set. That's the normal way we go about things. In feature tools, it's pretty incredible. There's got to be some things that you have to put in place. Uh, and that's the details around it, which I'll, which I'll leave out to you how to do it and all that. So, so that is uh, that and all you can see later. But generally speaking, uh, you know, what you can do is you can go back and uh, you can go back and explore the library. So all you do is you set up an ER entity relationship diagram, very much like your ER diagram. So this is how feature tools broadly works. So you define an entity set. Okay, you define an entity set. Just going to lay it out for you. So you have something called entity. Define an entity set. Entity set is basically client level of detail. Why client level of detail? Because uh, you know we want to basically get information about clients. The final data frame I want to create, I want to I want to basically uh, store it in the client level of detail. So that's how I, I will manage the whole thing here. Okay. So as I said, if you are doing the whole thing manually, what will you do? You will take client, you will do inner join with uh, with loans, you will do inner join with probably payments, and that's how you'll get the complete end-to-end -end data frame. But this is how we are actually structuring it. Inside that, you define the three different entities, client, loan, and payment, and you define the relationship between the entities, one to many relationship, one is to and one is to and cardinality. Okay, it is nothing but a simple ER diagram that we are creating. Right, that's it. So feature tools just requires that. It doesn't doesn't require you to manually join your tables, create a different data frames. So that's not required. All you do it is tell it that hey, this is my uh, final entity set. I want to create my final entity set at client ID level of detail. And here goes the individual entities, client loans and payments. Here goes the relationships. Now you figure out whatever you want to do. Okay, that's it. You, that, that's just the code you write. That's all the code you write. And this is pretty much what what you do inside feature tools. You, you specify the entities, you specify the entities, you can see entities are created, clients, loans, and payments. You specify the relationships. So at the end of the entire process, this is created. You can see right now, entity set is client, that is client level of detail. These are the three entities I've got. And these are the, these are the two relationships I've got. Loan to client, one to many, payment to loan, one to many. That's it, that's the entire structure that you define. And from there, uh, feature tools is one line of code. Okay, then you use feature tools, it, it applies to different types of transformations. 
and it starts creating features like this okay it starts creating automatic features like this now you can argue with me fine this is this is not a big deal right month of join what's the big deal about this feature well i agree with you it's not a big deal a month of join is a very simple feature you you might have you might have uh, hypothesized about that feature you might you might be able to use your domain knowledge also to create features like this but hey like feature tools is doing it automatically for you so tell you is very subtle but i think you will agree with me it's one thing to come up with something from scratch completely from scratch you think of a feature it's another thing somebody is already giving you some answer and you just looking at it and you're trying to say okay hey i think that could be a good feature there's a big difference actually so it's one thing to come up with a feature completely from scratch right now month of joint as a feature was not there okay now we can debate about it see once you see this it's like you know it's like you know it's like looking at the solution and saying okay you know i could have also thought about it no <laughs> but once you see it's one thing to come up with this feature completely from scratch and it's quite another thing that a library is automatically telling you okay this could be a good possibility and now you're saying okay yes indeed it's a good possibility i think i think knowing the month actually matters so who knows like normally i might have a lot of customers joining in during christmas time that might be a very interesting pattern for me right so if i can create a feature of month of join on the basis of that i might want to do some modeling who knows i might find a very interesting relationship between month of join and uh, you know uh, the the uh, uh, the default rate i don't know i mean something very interesting like typical people who typically sign up before christmas tend to default a lot due to whatever reasons i'm not getting into all that but i'm just saying like people who typically join uh, you know like before this particular time typically tend to default a lot or people who typically join around this time tend to default a lot or tend to you know take these kind of loans i might find some correlations out of nowhere okay so these are some uh, very interesting ways to look at it so month of joint is an automatic feature but look at this one it even goes to the level of uh, creating features like this <coughs> mean of payments or payments amount this is a nice feature i think you will agree with me for every single customer if i'm saying what is your average payment amount that means a lot i think that's a very good feature i would say right because each customer if i know what is you know what is your average uh, uh, what is the average payment amount that you do payment amount is the payment table remember there, there are three tables right client loan and payments so now you're saying at client level of detail what is the average payment you do which is pretty interesting right because now i know across all the loans you have taken on an average how much do you pay so uh, i'm get just getting ready to understand little bit about your repayment uh, ability okay little bit about and hey this need not be mean it could be max it could be min and you get so much about it you can even get standard deviation of payment amount right standard deviation will give you something very interesting over the customer you know what what it will tell you if you calculate std of payment amount that will tell you how how fickle minded the customer is maybe this will be a very interesting uh, attribute for me because if i if i can say that for some customers the payment amount is actually very the standard deviation is very high you know what it means that means the customer is probably very fickle minded not a reliable customer not a very reliable customer sometimes the customer is paying a lot sometimes the customer is not paying a lot it's all over the place that's the problem it's, these are beautiful features which again just purely based on domain knowledge it will take you a lot of time to come up with these features but feature tools will create it automatically for you using the perm combinations it will create automatically for you and now on the basis of that you can use your correlation and decide if it's a good feature or not if you want to keep it that is your call but you know you're not starting from scratch it's a helper library i'm not saying you can straight away using your modeling and you know you can do magic with it but it 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 basically you can say it is one step step towards creating that magic it helps you to create that magic okay and as i said it will end up creating features like this for you in a way these are the kind of features it will end up creating for you <clears throat> so without any control out of originally let's say 10 or 15 or features i had feature tools has automatically created 797 features for me automatically and this process is what we call deep feature synthesis this this process of you know feature tools trying to apply permutation combination of different features and operations and creating newer features for you this this process is what we call deep feature synthesis okay so uh, and you can see some of these features are very good features i think uh, for each customer knowing the mean loan amount is very important because guess guess gives me some idea as to uh, you know like how reliable the customer is and what kind of loans it takes like I i'm not very comfortable with a customer who Whose, whose standard deviation of loan amount is very high. Understand that feature. Very interesting feature. STD of loan amount. Actually, feature tools will create that also. All possible aggregations you will apply. Okay, you can see knowing the max loan amount is very important. Even knowing the min loan amount is very important. And if there is a huge dispersion between max and min, that tells me that here is a customer who sometimes takes very high loans, sometimes takes very little loans. So I don't know. Like probably tells you something about the fickle mindedness of the customer. Like maybe you don't have very clear planning going on. maybe maybe you're not able to plan this thing 
like what kind of money you actually need i i, I can see one month just 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 recently you took a loan which is of ten thousand dollars and now you're taking a loan which is of let's say hundred 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 dollars something of that sort right so again standard deviation is an extremely powerful metric which again normally when you do feature engineering nobody will even think of these things okay but once you see feature tools giving it to you now you start thinking hey this could be a good metric for me so again these are some uh, very interesting ways to uh, you know ideate on features <coughs> okay okay great but then the problem is once you go to deeper level features the 797 features is a lot of features right so once you go to deeper level features once you go to deeper level features you will start seeing that uh, these kind of features don't have any significance at all so definitely most of the features will be good quality features but uh, then there might be certain features where you you may not find any interpretability okay you may not find any any obvious interpretability coming up in in these aspects okay but hey, like there's one other very important thing I do want to clarify. The reason why we get into these kind of black box approaches, okay? One of the important things is because correlation, correlation does not imply causation. Very important. I know we talked a lot about correlation the other day, but I think it's important to clarify this part. Correlation does not imply causation. And what it what it intuitively means is what it what it intuitively means is <clears throat> that a feature can have a very high correlation for example and i'll give an example to you okay you know for, let's say let's say this particular feature might have a very strong correlation with the output might have whatever the output column is let's say output column is you're trying to predict defaults could be i mean i don't have a default column here but let's say it's a classification model where you're trying to predict defaults and these are all possible features you have created now, how do you do the modeling now? This is all feature extraction, by the way. Polynomial features was one kind of feature extraction we discussed, black box features. This is one more kind of automated feature extraction we are discussing. So now you create 797 features, but will you use all 797 features to uh, kind of predict default? Of course not. Now you will use that uh, feature importance we discussed yesterday. Uh, you know, you will do it that way. You try to decide which features are important features. So correlation is what you're looking at. Correlation in this case means separation, feature importance. But does it always imply causation? It doesn't. So although a particular feature might be very strongly related to the default column, you know there's a very strong correlation that exists, but can you always explain the cause? You cannot. What is the cause? I don't, I myself don't even know what this feature is, but the maps beautifully adds up in certain cases. So not always will you find an explanation and you're okay with it. This is where machine learning starts becoming more of a black box. And you're okay with it. That's, that's again a game of trade-offs. It's what we call the accuracy interpretability trade-off. If you want to build a highly accurate solution, you have to try out techniques like this. Hey, who knows? You're creating magic. You're creating magic out of unknown features, which you cannot interpret, but maybe, maybe the permutation combination of these features are creating something new that we would not even have fathomed in this particular domain. It's a beautiful way of kind of coming up with newer features, which we said is a correlation, which is the correlation, but there's no causation because we ourselves don't know what the feature is. This is very, very important and it goes to you know, so many different uh, use cases of this particular thing. If I have to list out a few other very interesting use cases. <clears throat> so Walmart actually had this case study. If you, uh, you know, like uh, just gonna list out this very interesting case study from Walmart that they uh, conducted. And they actually found that, they actually found that uh, people typically tend to buy lots of strawberry pop tarts during hurricanes. Next time, whenever a hurricane is about to strike, the, the, the sales of strawberry pop tarts went up drastically. They observe the correlation. Can you observe, can you find causation? You cannot. There's no causation there, guys. There's a strong correlation. There's a very strong correlation between uh, <clears throat> you know hurricanes and strawberry pop tarts, but there is no causation right now. There's absolutely no causation in this process. You can't explain causation. I mean, yes, you can obviously go back and do a separate behavioral study, understand why. But hey, like hurricanes, people will like to buy torch light, you know, torch maybe uh, uh, batteries, dry fruits, right? You're preparing for. A natural disaster right you might want to get some you know dry fruits and stuff but pop, pop tarts like i don't know like maybe pleasure food or something okay whatever i mean there can be different reasons to interpret that but primarily looking at this result on the face of it i'm sure all of you are surprised with this but generally if you think about it maybe yes you can find some you know like we can always find interpretability out of anything maybe you can still analyze and say okay maybe this is healthy this is easy, easy to eat and all that we can always argue about it but still on the face of it it's a it's an amazing correlation nobody will even think of it in, in the first the data science will give you wonderful associations like this generally okay walmart had another very famous case study that they conducted which i'm sure all of you have read about it heard about it uh, just to further uh, you know expand on that concept 
this is another very interesting uh, case study where they where they said that people who buy a buy beer also buy diaper i'm sure all of you would have heard about it in some capacity right so beer diaper the impossible correlation so they found that this was a case study they conducted long back the initial forbes article came out in 1998 so this goes like uh, more than two more than two decades back you can see how old that particular case study so association rule mining association analysis has been done for a long time it is not a new topic at all just to clarify and there goes the impossible correlation the beer diaper correlation so we found that people who buy buy beer also buy diaper people who generally buy beer also buy diaper so again correlation is strong yes we are seeing a pretty strong correlation between these uh, between these two items but uh, can we infer any causation can we say why it happened why why people are buying beer and diaper together well on the face of it it sounds like it's like sounds like something impossible but i mean once you start taking a deeper look at it i think it it becomes clear what is happening how it happens so just by looking at correlation uh, the bottom line is a feature might be an excellent predictor of the output the maths might work out beautifully but you may not necessarily be able to explain why it's happening so this is one of the uh, important things i wanted to highlight and feature tools again uh, one of the reasons why it's only very recently i'm saying these are things that are very very new that i'm talking about right now uh, this this acquisition happened only last year october 2019 we're talking about and and there's a very high amount of renewed interest in this field right now there are not many libraries i'm quoting one of the best right now for you uh, but there are very few companies that are actually doing this work <clears throat> of automated feature engineering it's such a such an important thing if i can if i can have a machine or ai automatically generate features for me then we are not required actually <laughs> tomorrow there's no use for, for, for data scientists like us Okay, you get your data set, put a data set, the model will auto automatically figure out, okay, you know what, these pieces are the best features, put it in, and hey, out comes the model for you. Then where is your need? It, you may not have any need after some time, okay? But yes, obviously, you know, human beings will still be required because uh, people look for some amount of interpretability and domain will never go away. One of the reasons why machines will never quite take over in a way. So we still need uh, human intervention in some capacity. Okay. So one of the things that we do, so as you can see here, uh, we are creating 797 features, which is obviously a, a lot of features. But one, one of the ways to limit this is to probably go back and use depth. Generally, we use something called depth. And what we do using depth is we say that uh, we are limiting it to only uh, two, two levels. <clears throat> That's the way to look at depth. We are limiting it to only two levels. The original one that I showed you, there was no limit I imposed. I let it, uh, you know, I let it grow freely. I let it to even four or five levels deep it went. <clears throat> but beyond that level, the features become very, very uh, uninterpretable. They become like black boxes. Okay. So to keep some interpretation component, you're just putting a depth of equal to two. All right. So uh, depth of equal to two basically means two levels of aggregations we are doing. Okay. So uh, can anybody interpret this feature for me? What it means? Last of mean of. See, again, let me tell you once again, if you normally do feature engineering, most likely you will not even think of this feature. Generally, I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, like, if you just take the data set as it is, maybe it will take you a lot of time to come up with this feature. Now, if I've used feature tools, feature tools automatically created this feature for me. And now we are looking at it together and we can beautifully interpret this feature. It's a very powerful feature, by the way. Anybody wants to tell me what it means? What does this feature mean? What does it convey? How do you interpret this feature? <clears throat> Take a guess. Take a guess, guys. So, the mean of all the last payment loans or one, different loans. Mean of the last payment loans. Mean. Uh, <laughs> very close. You're very close, actually. But how will you refine that sentence? Rephrase it for me. Yes. There's a payments table. Payment table means you're capturing uh, how much of loan payments you're making, EMI installments basically. Loan table, loan ID of detail, loan level of detail. Okay. So, Praveen, you're very close by the way. Somebody else wants to take a cue from what Praveen said and rephrase that answer quickly. It's like a nested function. Think of it like a nested operation you're doing. The first inner, then outer. Think of it that way. So, last loan, what is the average payment? <clears throat> mean of the last payment goal. Mean of the last, mean of the last payment to the loan? No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> so what it means is, uh, so what it means is, look at the last. Okay, look at the last loan. Remember, all of this are the client level of detail, right? 
So go to the loan table, search for the last loan that the client took. Last loan on the basis of loan date. Okay, get the last loan that the client took. Okay, and for that last loan, what is the average payment? What is the average payment you made as a last loan? Straightforward. This is a very powerful feature, by the way. Because if I am trying to decide whether to give you a loan or not, I would like to know how much payment you made in the last loan. It's a very important feature. And I'll tell you, you can combine these features along with repaid. There was a repaid feature of, and there is so much of feature engineering you can possibly do. This is amazing, like incredible. Like once you have this raw data, uh, you know, we, we had like repaid feature, we had this feature. And it's so incredible how you can combine these features now. Once you, now, now you start thinking about it. See, initially, if I just give you three tables, three blank tables, very hard to come up with these features, right? But now that you get some direction, now we can start discussing, okay, shine, you know, like this is one feature we can create. Possibly we can also create a feature like this, you know, like how many times count of, maybe count of, uh, you know, like look at the last loan, look at the last loan and the last loan you have taken, what is the count of, what is the count of repaid? Something of that sort. Like last loan, how many times you repaid? Uh, sorry, not, not repaid, sorry. How many times you, maybe standard deviation, okay? Uh, <clears throat> sorry, last loan, repaid, repaid value. So you're basically looking at what is the count of, what is the count of repaid? How many times you have repaid? Okay, and maybe we can also say the last loan, did you repay or not? So we can look at last loan and we can say, did you repay or not? So was the last loan repaid or not? So, so many uh, you know, amazing features you can actually get. Okay, and we can also set a standard deviation of payments. So I, I, I want to specifically understand how was your behavior in the last loan? What was the average payments you made? What was the standard deviation of payments you made? What was the skew of payments you made? Skewness, very interesting. I mean, again, these are features people will generally not fathom, right? But you can actually create a feature like this. You can say last of loans, last of loans dot skew, skew is another function you can use, dot skew and payment amount. Very, very powerful feature, by the way. You know what it tells you? It tells you that, hey, this was the last loan you took. And in that loan, you made several payments and the skewness of your payments looks somewhat like this. Very interesting. This might tell me something very interesting about the customer. Might tell me that, okay, average, you, you paid this much, but hey, there was very high rise skew. That means most of your payments were average to low and few of your payments are very high. So not a very consistent pair. Most of the months you paid very low and one of these months you paid very high. Not a very consistent, uh, you know, uh, uh, pair. So standard deviation very high, skewness is very high. So I'll be concerned about this customer. Something of that sort. You took a very high loan amount, yeah, but then hey, like your payment is uh, very, very irregular. Something of that sort. So very, very interesting ways you can, you can analyze uh, this data now. Just to, just to re-clarify what I mentioned here, this is pretty much what it means again. Just just to, to folks, I just need to confirm right now. Uh, just get confused right now. Just to clarify, this is what it means. Okay, <clears throat> you can see this feature represents the average amount for the last loan for each client. Across three different tables, you're able to aggregate it now. Okay, and they, they, they've got some wonderful demos planned. So please do take some time, go to the GitHub page of this company and see some of the other demonstrations they've given. I remember there's a very nice uh, relational database they have taken where they've actually taken 15 tables you know database and how they have used feature tools there so right now we are looking at three levels of join and there we are talking about 15 levels of join so it is pretty incredible how this works but one thing i must state uh, when you're using feature tools please follow it up with a round of feature selection so this is this is only feature extraction this is an automated way of doing feature extraction but once you do these kind of things, you must also uh, apply a round of feature selection. Okay, feature selection is now you're saying that, hey, out of these 800 odd features that you have automatically created or computed, uh, <clears throat> these are some of the most important features for me now. So th that's how you do, because you're not gonna use all 800 features for your modeling. Some of these features will be very important. The beautiful hidden correlations will come out. Uh, some of these features may not be so important. And that's the way to look at it. And correlations, by the way, just to repeat that initial part once again, guys, Correlation will come out from the most unlikeliest of places. Okay, and I think just to further, uh, you know, uh, just just to remove all doubts from your mind, let me let me present this for you. This is very incredible. This is a site called uh, Spurious Correlations. A person called Tyler Weijen who has compiled these beautiful list of correlations. Okay, you can just uh, look at this now, and you can see uh, spending on U.S. science-based technology and suicide by hanging, strangulation, and suffocation. There's no obvious relationship. You can't obviously explain what has each got to do with each other, but the correlation is 0.99, and it's an extremely strong correlation. I mean, if you know the other, you can predict the other. So that's pretty incredible. But can you explain the cause? You cannot. 
I mean, on the face of it, you cannot explain the cause, but hey, like we can always come back and try to have some arguments and say that, okay, you know what, both are linked to time. So you are spending the amount of money that you're spending and the amount of suicide you're committing, they're both to some extent linked to time, how much of uh, time you're spending. So uh, how much of time has passed? Because like as time passes, the US economy has grown. So naturally spending will happen. And as time has passed, like people are also more and more frustrated. There is more population. And these are all proportional things. No? Higher the population, more health issue, more suicides, more deaths. These are all proportional things, more frustration, more development means all those things happen, right? So these are all proportionate incidents that we have in, in life. And again, some very interesting, like if you go down, you'll be in, you'll, you'll enjoy some of these uh, things. Okay, so probably something like this, you know, like per capita cheese consumption and the uh, number of people who died by becoming tangled in their bed sheets. So this one, I mean, I don't think we can even find any logic behind this. There's no logic, but you know, as I say, correlation can come from the unlikeliest of places. You just take one data set from here, one data set from here, you know, wrap into two columns and say X versus Y we're looking at. But does it mean anything? There's no obvious causation, but it's like, it's more like, <clears throat> it's just correlation, right? These are what we call uh, spurious correlations. Uh, for that matter, age of Miss America, uh, correlating with murders by steam, hot vapors and hot objects. Like you're on, on one column, you've got age of Miss America and the other column you've got how many murders are being committed based on this. So again, there's no obvious relationship, but still seeing correlation. So very important actually, uh, you know, just to relate back to our discussion on correlation and causation, uh, please keep in mind this particular thing, very, very important actually. Correlation does not imply causation. Okay, and just to finally add one more interesting use case to this whole thing, if I give you one final use case, we have all these uh, health bands nowadays, the smart bands, okay, and very recently Amazon also launched, Amazon went into the market, they, they also launched their own smart band, I think hardly two days back, two to three days back, Amazon launched one of their uh, smart bands, and very interesting, Amazon smart bands even measures your emotional profile, which nobody else is doing. Everybody else is tracking your health and your sleep hours, heart rate and all that. But Amazon is claiming to kind of uh, measure even your heart, uh, sorry, your emotional uh, profile. Very, very interesting actually. Like they probably tend to correlate your health and your heart beats and your sleep. And uh, these are obvious patterns, no guys? Like if you sleep well and if your heart beat, resting heart rate is less, then I think generally you're a, you're a happy person and maybe they're trying to predict some mood and all that, like mood prediction. And there's so many, like the possibilities are endless in, in healthcare, what all you can do actually okay so I, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, you know we have reliance geo coming into this market so they've captured everything right now you've got geo fiber and they, they're probably giving it for free now you know recently updated their plans and probably the last thing we need is geo to come in and you know take over the health space which they're doing obviously they're tying up with some of these uh, med tech companies and probably you might have a smart band from geo like what we have geo phone and you'll have everybody wearing those smart bands maybe a year from now okay so <clears throat> Uh, the example that I wanted to put forward here is uh, steps versus weights. And what you have here is, what kind of, what kind of a relationship do you have guys? We all agree it's a negative uh, correlation. We all agree. So this is data that uh, <clears throat> companies will generally be able to collect from you. Like how much steps you take and what is your basic pattern with weight. So this is data you will easily get like steps versus weight correlation. Very clearly, it's an inverse correlation that we are seeing. Uh, question is, can you explain why this is happening? Can you explain causation right now? Impossible, you cannot. If you think about it, you cannot explain causation right now. You can explain correlation. You can say that as X increases, Y decreases the Y. But you cannot say, because I'm taking more steps, I'm losing weight. You cannot say that. I mean, I know on the face of it, you might argue sign is possible. Why, not? Why can't I say that? But let me tell you, you can't say that. One argument could be that because you're taking more steps, you're having lesser weight. Right? That is the obvious argument that because I'm walking more, I'm, I'm losing weight. That's the obvious argument. But hey, what about this argument? Because you're already very heavy, you're taking less steps. Possible, right? So now it depends on where you start from. What is the context? What if you look at it from this perspective? Because you're already heavy, because my weight is already so high, I cannot walk. I'm unable to go to work. So I'm anyways taking less steps. So very important. Again, correlation doesn't, so you're seeing an inverse correlation, but that doesn't mean that because of this, this is happening or this, no, could be anything. Like for example, the suicide versus uh, US spending, 
none of them had a correlation time was causing both to happen as time has progressed economy has grown and population has increased so there is some hidden latent variable that is impacting both so correlation by itself doesn't imply causation between the two features very important this is exactly what data science and when we are building predictive models this takes and takes uh, this is exactly the uh, the thing that matters a lot which is why hidden features and you know all these uh, black box features that we are talking about automated feature engineering we are okay with these things because we are saying hey like there might be some features which are latent features which we may not have discovered which domain knowledge is not able to explain to us but hey it just works and if it works we are okay with it and now we'll try to figure out okay like what could possibly be the reason behind why this feature is working that could be the next level analysis we can actually do okay and from a, from a customer point of view i'll, I'll tell you like uh, the story was very different maybe a few years back even a few years back customers wanted models to be built which were highly interpretable like uh, <clears throat> if you use any feature especially in the finance industry fintech industry and the kind of work you guys are also doing is very like you can't just randomly come up with features you know like xyz some random features you come up with is very hard to sell it because ultimately uh, you know for your for that model to be clear there will be several reviews that will happen and it's very hard like this was a, there was a natural friction and resistance towards black box features even a few years back but today we are seeing that change customers are okay to compromise on the uh, the interpretability aspect to, to to improve the accuracy aspect ultimately i want to build accurate models interpretability is fine so i'll give a simple example to you because sometimes people you know they they feel like okay what the, the point is imagine a doctor i'll give a simple example to you okay? If you're a doctor, you go to a doctor, you take an X-ray. Okay, simple example I'm taking. You go to a doctor, you take an X-ray, and the doctor tells you, "Sign, I look at this X-ray. I think you have a fracture." You no, know, the doctor looks at the X-ray for some time, and he and he looks at some patterns, and he says, "Okay, you know what? Uh, from my experience, I I, th I think I think you have a fracture." Doctor says you have a fracture. Do you ask the doctor why? I mean, the doctor has given a report. No, doctor has said fracture. Like, imagine all the consultations you have done in your life. Do you ever ask a doctor why have you written this? Why have you prescribed the medicine? Please explain, doctor. Okay, you go to the doctor. I have cough, I have cold, I am coughing and sneezing, whatever. Doctor gives the medicine. Do you ever ask? Okay, doctor, please tell me why this have you given the medicine? Doctor will say something, something, something. Do you do you try to precisely question? Please tell me exactly what you saw in the fracture. Please tell me exactly what point you saw in the fracture which made you believe it's a fracture. <laughs> like i mean see i'll tell you what even human decision making at that level is totally based on ml it's very much the same thing machines are doing the same thing doctors are not 100% sure also doctors they are basing it on their domain knowledge <clears throat> so the way doctors learn is the same way machines are also learning idea is the same doctors have learned from their past historical experience they have learned lots and lots of x rays they have seen lots and lots of x rays in their experience and they have seen okay these are x-rays which are fractured these are x-rays which are not fractured okay here comes a new x-ray and i think based on whatever i learned it's a fracture machine learning doctors are not doing anything different can doctor exactly explain to you exactly why he or she explained fracture well i mean you you might you might actually try to do it okay this is the pattern but it's very hard not okay i mean if you it, it's like saying uh, let's say you're asking a, a security officer in the airport like please tell me wh on what basis you uh, predicted this person is suspicious like on suspicion and you can be arrested right police can arrest you on suspicion whatever but please tell me on what basis you arrested me like you will never question that I mean, a lot of lot of these subtle human decision making happens based on gut feel you would have heard this term so many times gut feel like when you hire a person you get that instant connect like you like the person i think the person is doing something really well i think i like his answer you feel an you know like whatever i mean this like <laughs> you can call it love at first sight whatever you, you might want to use it but the point is there are a lot of these things which you cannot explain right it's more like it's more like it it, it 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 just it just it just it just adds up you cannot explain it it you just know it's it's what it is right so given this input you just know the output but you may not be able to exactly explain based on precisely what x y z features you 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 thought this was possible and even if you could possibly explain it the other person will not get it that's a, that's what gut feel is right so even so even uh, if the ceo tells you that hey you know what this is why i thought i should expand to this market this is the x y z is it entirely based on data no it might be based on some other feature which is very hard to explain and this is exactly why we are also like in the current day and age why deep learning is taking off why 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 some of these black box models are taking off is because like we are okay to have we, we are okay to have uh, slightly lesser interpretable models but we are we want more accurate models we want accuracy ultimately right so that's the way to look at it <clears throat> again it's a very fine balance a very fine balance and there are still domains like especially healthcare and finance where 
the regulations are still very strong right now but uh, i think most of these things you will find a lot in consumer facing applications like the kind of work amazon is doing the kind of work probably facebook and these kind of companies are doing all the tech companies uh, so they have more leeway to uh, roll it out into the solutions like the kind of work that google lens is doing and google duplay is doing they don't have to deal with as many regulations as cross probably uh, you know an apollo hospitals or maybe for that matter uh, uh, you know uh, uh, an intuit or maybe for that matter an icic bank has to deal with okay and which is to tell you and just to tell you how uh, you know how sensitive this domain can be i think we have all used chatbots in some capacity right we all know chatbots i think by now we all understand what chatbots are and just to tell you chatbots have been there for a long time right i, I, I long time i would say so icic bank also has it something called ask ipal they have also got something called ask ipal so <clears throat> my question to you guys is on the face of it do you guys think this is the actual chatbot what kind of a chatbot do you think this is will you classify this as a chatbot my question to all of you this this only came out few years back very new actually this this feature also in icic bank use case is pretty new what we are talking about so what are your thoughts like this this is only applicable for people who have used it if you have not used it then you will not know it but not only this you can take any bank for that matter any bank in the indian ecosystem if you take like what do you think what kind of a what kind of a thing do you think this is i think it's a uh, rule based like, it's rule based primarily exactly yeah rule based you can see already you're getting keyword based search like if you ask me what's your name like all these are you know all these are uh, you know questions that it will it will basically have like what is your name like i mean i'm not expecting this answer right and um, like probably uh, you know like uh, what is the weather today but i mean you you can't you can't get answers for all possible sets of questions right if you say what is the weather today and all that like you know you can't expect uh, to get this kind of answer whatever i mean i'm just saying i'm just saying generally like you know like if you ask the same question to google google will give the right answer no like if you ask google google you ask anything it will give the right answer it is it's totally based on machine learning and deep learning but this is not machine learning at all this is some very very minimal amount of uh, modeling that they have done on the back end but mostly it is as rashmi rightly puts it is rule based search it's very very rule based search. so so you have basically <laughs> basically uh, kept a track of all the possible keywords you have kept a uh, you have kept a track of all the possible keywords and now you are basically saying okay uh, you know what uh, so so given the you know given the a uh, question consists of these 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 keywords i'm going to give these 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 options and if the first customer chooses this particular option then uh, you know this is what the results are going to look like this is pretty much how the whole thing works out in this this context okay and of course like you know if you if you ask it what is the best so obviously you can see this is the wrong answer if you say what is the best mutual fund i should invest in like do you expect an answer here <laughs> well obviously like that's a you know, there be a blunder actually for icic bank to give an answer to it what is the best mutual fund well i mean it's not exactly what i wanted like it it it, it is not giving you like one answer set of 10 mutual funds like here goes the top 20 it could have easily shown me a recommendation of icic bank's recommendations but see these are very sensitive models because i don't want to end up in a loop where the model gives an incorrect prediction and you know customer then goes back and invests in that fund and customer says hey, this is what your ask ipl said no <laughs> and then who is to pay that fine i see say bankers too. so many of these things are uh, you know subject to heavy government scrutiny so uh, machine learning and ai is to talk about in the fintech space is like subject to far more scrutiny than maybe other kinds of like ola and you know you can think of ola and all these companies like it's not that risky that's not that sensitive so this is a, again a very very fine balance that we have in today's world okay <clears throat> just wanted to talk a little bit on that front so please use it i have shared this automated feature engineering snippet with all of you i think you will enjoy it and as you are building models uh, you know try to use it and even if you are not probably uh, i would say even if you are not using it in your production code which maybe you might not want to but probably this kind of thing may not be acceptable in certain context because it's black box completely but i would say use it as a helper mechanism at least help allow it to guide you that okay these could be possible features okay something on those uh, lines <clears throat> what i want to do right now uh, i do want to take a step into another kind of classification problem we have talked a lot about classification uh, you know yesterday and today i want to start off with another very interesting kind of problem but this is going to be on a textual data set until now we have not seen textual data uh, but what i want to do right now is give all of you a very 
small and very subtle exposure to how you handle textual data just to introduce you to the beautiful world of nlp just so that you get an idea that okay given a textual data how do i convert it please remember uh, you have to understand all the machine learning models that you're talking about whether it's a regression model whether it's a classification model all the machine learning models ultimately they are mathematical equations you're trying to uh, create some kind of a function approximation that maps a y to an x x to a y okay that's what you're trying to do so you cannot directly use unstructured data as it is if your data is in image format if your data is in a textual format there has to be a strategy that you use to convert that data into a, a numerical format that's a very important thing to do initially okay now question is how do you do that how do you convert this data into a you know numerical format how do you convert this kind of info data into a numerical format right so so this is a, a yelp data set yelp is a review site uh, you might have heard of yelp okay and these are all real data that we are looking at right now just to give you a sense of what we are trying to achieve here so this is this is one uh, of these reviews that you're looking at text so text looks somewhat like this uh, you can see i have no idea why some people give and I love the gyro play. The general manager Scott Patello is a good egg. That means it's a very positive review. The text will consist of the review information. And then finally, uh, you can look at the, uh, the business ID. The business ID is the establishment ID basically, like which restaurant we are talking about. Uh, the date will give you some information as to uh, which date the review was given. The review ID is obviously the uh, unique identifier that maps the review and the stars is basically what you're trying to predict this is effectively the uh, how much of stars you have given effectively okay so at its core to simplify it we are solving a sentiment analysis problem what kind of a problem are we solving we are solving a sentiment analysis problem so you're trying to predict in a way uh, <clears throat> what is the sentiment of that person sentiment analysis model is what we're trying to build okay so text type uh, user id user id gives some information about who the users are okay and uh, finally we have got some other last three columns you can ignore that like cool useful fun you can ignore that so just to clarify the crux of what we are trying to do a quick high level two minutes on this uh, this is a sentiment analysis problem we have heard a lot about sentiment analysis i think in the web uh, typically this becomes very prominent in election campaigns and all right sentiment analysis is the is a buzzword right and it's a, it's a very very uh, you know useful thing that companies do nowadays okay but just to just to you know get away from all that theoretical hype and come back to the bare bones of what we are trying to do there uh, we have got some textual data and we are trying to classify whether that textual data is positive sentiment or negative sentiment now the textual data can be a review the textual data can be uh, it can it, it, it can be anything it can be in any medium right it can be a tweet in twitter maybe let's say narendra modi tweet something okay i'll just give you an example let's see he has a twitter account and his Twitter account is manned by, you know, like a lot of big people sitting in the IT team, BJP's IT cell, and they manage it. He's not, he's not going to sit in Twitter and do all the big people, right? So they're not going to, you know, just reply and all that. So there are people managing his Twitter account, and there's a lot of data science that goes into the, uh, you know, like uh, some of the work that they do. So, uh, <clears throat> so they will look at his Twitter account and they'll try to, uh, you know, figure out that, okay, this person posted this kind of a comment. So, Okay, the review of this comment is supposedly positive. Okay, so you write something about Independence Day and a lot of people start commenting on that particular tweet. And it's public data, so you can actually get it. I mean, please from your account, you can, you can scrape that data, you can analyze. Okay, this is what people wrote. This is the comment that people wrote. And based on whatever classification model I already have with me, the comment is categorized to be uh, positive with 69% probability. Okay, now you can get something very interesting. You can basically get information about uh, the average sentiment level for that particular tweet. And see, like, there will always be lovers and haters, right? That's, the, that's, that's how the world works, right? Nobody, everybody will not love you. Everybody will not hate you. There's always going to be equilibrium. So, you know, no matter how good you are, that's, that's, that's how the world is, right? So now the point is, uh, you know, here also, in Modi's case, what will happen is probably for that particular tweet, they will want to look at several different metrics. Now, what are the possible metrics they might want to look at? Like what are the possible metrics they might want to look at? Uh, so if I just have to represent this whole thing here. So for that particular tweet, there can be several comments that are come up. There can be several tens of thousands of comments that are coming. 20,000 comments, let's say, on that particular tweet. 
each comment is like a text each comment is like a text so you already have a trained classification model that you have already trained remember this part is important in you you already have to have a classification model trained okay this is not your training data this is the model working in production just to clarify so even before you use it here you better have a trained classification model <clears throat> so let's say this is my model this model is able to take in any review and is able to <coughs> classify it as zero or one based on negative or positive simple example i'm taking practically we discussed yesterday we look at predict probas probability of prediction is more relevant but i'm just taking a simple example here you will just take a review and classify that that review as negative or positive simple okay now now uh, so so let's say here comes review one and you say this is a negative review here comes the second review positive review and stuff like that right? you can go back and classify each of these reviews in this fashion and now we can basically do a count and there's so much you can do now you can basically look at a count you can look at how many people rated positive and all that right you can create a histogram around it and there's so many amazing things that you can, that you can do on this right now okay so out of for, for one to eight you can generate an entire plethora of statistics showing that okay how were people across the country generally responsive to your tweet so most people were positive most people had negative sentiment a few had negative sentiment and hey you can even plot a histogram as, or, or kind of a you know you can plot this kind of a thing now see practically i told you right uh, <clears throat> in practical scenario we always look at predict probas right in practical scenarios we always look at predict probas so predict proba will give you probability of positive tweet let's say probability of one let's say this 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 is a point one probability is positive this is a point two probability is positive <coughs> sorry point one point two probability is positive this is the point eight probability positive and 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 what you are seeing right now this is the point seven nine probability is positive point nine probability of positive point nine probability of positive and what you are seeing right now is something very interesting you are seeing for that particular tweet most of these uh, you know uh, um, most of these sentiments are highly positive few sentiments are negative and you're seeing a light skewed distribution so this is the positive uh, one side zero side probability of uh, uh, you know uh, a positive very interesting this tells you something very powerful now it tells you that most people responded with positive sentiment and few people responded with negative sentiment and and these are the kind of things that you will actually like to see okay these are the things you will actually like to see this is the way to analyze and standard deviation if standard deviation is very high that that kind of tells you that hey you know what like there's too much of distortion like there's this high opinion difference if you find two distinct clusters of data very interesting like for twitter analysis if you look at two distinct clusters of data for example what if i see this i mean see these are all high highly polar issues right maybe you tweet something about the ayodhya you know blast uh, whatever i think this was a very controversial judgment that happened very recently if you know like there was a big win that they got Okay, the Ayodhya judgment that happened, and it was a big day. Like you know, there was a huge amount of security measures that were taken, and you might have seen this kind of a plot, right? Maybe this kind of a thing. I don't know. Like probably uh, there's there's one chunk of people who had, you know, like highly positive sentiment, and one chunk of people highly negative sentiment, and something of that sort. Something of that sort you had. Okay, so so that gives you an idea that yes, it's a polar, very very highly polar issue in a way. Okay. So very interesting, and politicians use it use it left, right, center. I mean, Trump campaigns happen now. I mean, U.S. elections will happen in November, and this was popularized by, I would say, uh, <clears throat> the entire idea of social media analytics was popularized by uh, Barack Obama. <clears throat> so very interesting. Uh, it ran a very big campaign, and I think this was one of the. It came up in the front uh, news stories. Okay, so you know, like, uh, so it was a big. It was you know, it was a big. That's the whole idea of change that he. you know presented and the way it was marketed and the way analytics was used was incredible they read about it very interesting like and they actually talked about it how social media was used back that time and you know like and then i think it was uh, further popularized by uh, modi in 2014 that was the modi when he uh, made a landmark uh, victory bjp won a landmark victory after you know like from the coalition obviously so again uh, major major use of Uh, social media in fact uh, when rahul gandhi lost that time he came to national television and he actually admitted <laughs> you can go back to some of the uh, news stories and see uh, he actually admitted to national television that possibly we could have used data science more and in even in the last uh, elections 2019 like and he they did use it they did use it uh, you know they did they did go back and use social media and that that particular thing but again like uh, uh, Go, you you can i mean there's, there's a lot of other things that are involved as well so it's not just tech you know operations ground operations there's so many other things around it so elections are not only one on uh, you know twitter sentiment analysis and you know data science data science is one very small component of it uh, there was a very shocking finding i don't know if you believe it or not 
almost the entire chartered fleet of the country like you talk when i talk about chartered fleet i mean you know helicopters planes almost the entire chartered fleet of the country was blocked by uh, you know bjp in a way i mean so you you need a lot of other fire power also like see at the end of the day data science can give you the strategy if your sentiment is positive it means okay local leader you please go here and deliver this address so I, as a data scientist i can tell you that yes you are the politician fight uh, campaigning here so please go here and use these 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 keywords so i will write that entire speech for you i'll prepare that entire speech for you i'll include those keywords and i'll ensure that the sentiment is positive i can ensure that but you have to go there no that's operations you cannot deliver the speech from virtually no you have to travel there for traveling you need you need planes you need helicopters big people will not go in cars no so you need to travel from place a to place b how do you travel the entire charter fleet was blocked okay so those were all operational very interesting things you will find so read about it there was a article that came out uh, <clears throat> so anyway so that's a different discussion the bo bottom line basically is that the when you are doing sentiment analysis that record can be a tweet that record can be a facebook post that record can be a review in some site it can be amazon review it can be any review it can be absolutely anything so that row can be absolutely anything just to give you some context of what we are talking it can even be a book review for that matter you can i can even look at a book review maybe a book and you are trying to kind of qualify whether the book is whatever okay so out of all these use cases what we are talking about we are talking about a review so in the, in our case we looking at yelp review so each row and again all of this was just to clarify what each row actually is So each row can be a post, Facebook post. Each row can be a Twitter tweet, tweet, or each row can be a book review. Each row can be a Yelp review. Either way, okay. So this is the sentiment analysis use case we are talking. But is this the only way to use classification in the context of uh, textual data? No, there are so many other things you can do. The moment you can convert your textual data into a numeric format, if you are able to, if you are successfully able to convert your textual data to a numeric format, you can do magic with your models now. You can do so many. There are so many use cases now. sentiment analysis is one use case <clears throat> but let me give you one more beautiful use case this is one use case where you take a review and you try to classify it as positive negative sentiment what about other use case look at what facebook is doing right now okay facebook is trying to uh, like there's been a lot of reporting that has happened that people post fake information on facebook and all that stuff right? we, have, we have heard about it read about it and what facebook is trying to do is they're trying to uh, <clears throat> you know come up with approaches through which they're trying to detect whether a particular uh, post may be fake or not that's what they are trying to do how do you think that's happening machine learning once again so they are looking at historical data they are trying to analyze patterns and they are trying to detect that okay what is the probability that this post is a fake or not so again this is a very interesting uh, idea uh, very hard to do by the way but that's exactly one of the things that they are trying to do you look at a particular thing you read a particular story pick up the keywords pick up all the other information around it and you try to uh, predict the probability of fake what is the probability that this is fake or what is the probability this is the uh, you know uh, uh, this is derogatory this is violent okay this is racist because these are things that facebook will not allow on their platform right so if, if that is the thing machine learning and ai is helping facebook to predict these things is that the only level no facebook has a lot of manual people also working on the content side they have hired a lot of people they face a lot of flack in the recent congress investigations congressional inquiries right and they they actually started hiring a lot of manual uh, labor for this purpose but obviously manually it's extremely hard right imagine youtube for that matter such a such an such an extremely hard problem okay i mean it's like saying every minute you are uploading probably you know like a per minute you are probably uploading like uh, hours of youtube video even if you want to you cannot watch all of youtube in your lifetime right <laughs> that's the statistics okay every minute you are you are uploading hours of uh, youtube content every minute or every second that's the stats behind it so even if you want to you cannot possibly see all the youtube videos <clears throat> how do you ensure that the content is good lest it become something like a tiktok right there's been so much of flag tiktok as face right anyway that's another dip discussion altogether but the point is how do you ensure the youtube content is strong how do you ensure the stuff that is actually put up there is good is good quality often times you would have seen and this happens quite a lot in the platform like you you see some thumbnail but then when you go to the video the video is something else and then how do you do that how do you ensure okay <clears throat> many of these times what will happen is when new movies get released you will find that uh, uh, people will give different different titles titles they will change but actually when you click on that thing you will find hey this is the movie that i'm watching this movie just got released 
and then after a day you will find it taken down how does it happen machine learning is being applied in a lot of it google is google ultimately right you can't compete with google can you <laughs> so google is doing a lot of machine learning on the youtube platform and in fact all google products so they're looking at each and every video video is what is what is that is ultimately image uh, numeric numbers image data video data textual data all numbers ultimately right <clears throat> so they're looking at the thing and they're trying to basically uh, predict what is the probability it is fake what is the probability it is defamatory what is the probability it is uh, you know like uh, whatever it is not suitable or it is not safe whatever that is okay so that's one of the ways they are trying to implement it <clears throat> and of course they are they are looking at a bunch of other information like often times the community reports it they also take a lot of rich feedback from the community i mean if you report a particular video that becomes another feature in the facebook thing so again that feature again that particular video i got this many reports okay again that particular profile i got this many blocks and that becomes a feature if there are too many blocks and most likely this person is fake something of that sort something of that sort so that's one of the ways to uh, implement this whole thing okay anyways let's come back to the problem statement let's let's see how to implement this specific thing uh, to to do this <coughs> there's a little bit of theory that we have to discuss a quick two minutes on that with all of you so natural language is an amazing space right now generally i mean so nlp so one of the things that i say is you know computer vision largely we have mastered we have the techniques and we have the ways to do it uh, largely computer vision is something that we have that we have mastered in a way because you know there's so much that you have in image data if you look at you know objects around you and things around you uh, there's not much that will change i mean it's like tables will look like tables chairs will look like chairs i mean elephants will look like elephants no guys so uh, if the machine has learned enough about elephants it's not that elephants will change overnight but i think one idea that's changing in a big way is computer vision very very interesting some of the some of the work that we are seeing and i think some of these things you will find very interesting some of these you you will you will find it very exciting like some of the things that that's happening right now maybe this is something that i posted today <clears throat> something i posted today in my uh, linkedin just going to share with you just going to share with you very interesting uh, there was this is a thing called invoice net okay? it's a deep learning model content is very different we're not getting into all that right now but just to give you the idea of it <clears throat> just to give you the idea of what we are using <clears throat> very interesting so 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 th th this person this is not my code i just shared uh, a, a content from you know this this amazing github repository i found they, they call it invoice net okay so what it does is it looks at a invoice and it analyzes the patterns of your invoice and it tries to basically extract the components out of it remember see many of you in this audience you can argue sai and i can i can use basic uh, you know text processing for it you know a string match and all this no that is not the case because invoices can look very different remember you 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 go and uh, take a invoice from some company invoice from some other company will they match not necessarily so this is trying to learn those patterns how incredible is that and 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 you already have the technology for it <clears throat> see will it always give you 100% accurate results not necessarily there are certain types of invoices which it may not work with but the, but we are assuming certain patterns like typically address will come at the top the bill will come at the bottom and the model is able to learn it amazing and and now the discussion basically is like okay then how do we ensure this model is accurate how do i how do i make it more accurate the way to make it more accurate is you have to give it more uh, training data <clears throat> give it more training data show it many 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 different types of invoices and here the model will learn ultimately ultimately all you require in a whether it's a machine learning model or it's a deep learning model all you require is inputs and outputs you just define what is the input what is the output let the algorithm take care of it for you you specify okay the inputs are you know a b c d e in this case the input is basically the image the output is basically uh, what you're expecting the invoice amount the gst whatever the tax rate is all of that is the output and the, the network learns on the basis of that it's a pretty complicated model if you think about it for a second there's a lot of uh, cnn being used here there's some amount of uh, sequential modeling being used here also so pretty complicated use case and and hey like if we can master this so i, I think the day is not far when uh, we will have you know machine learning models uh, able to you know read financial statements you know it will be amazing like you you have all these highly paid investment bankers you know working on mergers and acquisitions but what if we could automate the entire m and a process so that that i think that's very far fetched but probably uh, we are looking at an era where that happens very soon okay okay so uh, <clears throat> coming back to the if you
So it's going to write two simple reviews for all of you right now. All right, and now what you have to do is you have to convert these two reviews into a numeric format. All this while we've been talking about if theoretically convert to a number, convert to a number. Now we're going to learn specifically how to convert to a number. One of the most important techniques we'll talk about, the most basic technique we'll talk about here. You can extend on that, uh, but this is one of the most basic techniques on how to convert a, a, a textual data to an integer for numeric format. Okay? So what we do is we extract the text uh, the words out of it. So we look at this entire uh, textual data <clears throat> and what we do is, <clears throat> sorry, we basically extract the words out of it. What are the unique words which we call a vocabulary? So please go through all my reviews and please extract what are the unique words that have been used in the reviews. Okay, so please do that. So what are the unique words? Cat and good. Okay, simple enough. Okay, you might question me, Shine, why have you not used this? Because is this what we call a stop word? So we also make it a point to remove stop words. We call them stop words. What is stop word? Stop words are redundant words. Stop words are redundant words that add no value to the analysis. So we'll make it a point to remove these redundant words. Remove the stop words, okay? So these are the unique words that have been used. And now you, you see review one, review two, and obviously you will remove the redundant because see, ease will not have any impact on your sentiment, right? Whether you say cat is good, cat is bad, does, does ease have any impact on your sentiment? 100% not. So these are all stop words, redundant words. They only help you form a sentence, the semantics of it, but they don't really contribute to any sentiment as such. This will again depend a lot from domain to domain, but these are generic stop words we're talking about. Right? You might You might question me that, Hey, like if you're talking about a, a hospital use case, what is the stop word in a hospital use case? Let's say patient. You will use the patient a lot, right? If you're talking about a hospital data set, I'll probably use the word patient a lot there. Rather, if you talk about more of a Amazon kind of data set where I'm writing reviews, I don't think I will use patient a lot. In fact, patient means something very interesting there. If, if anybody writes about patient in a review, that might mean, I don't know, like that might mean something very negative. I don't know, I, it's probably like I felt like a patient in a coma. I don't know, probably you might, if you might write a review over the product. It's an analogy that you're stating. So patient is not a very common word that Amazon will find in their OnePlus phone reviews. I'm just giving an example. I'm not, nothing against OnePlus, the great phone, okay. <laughs> so, uh, but let's say, let's just say that somebody puts a review saying that I, I felt, uh, using this phone, I felt a patient in a coma, something of that sort. But that, is that a stop word? It's not a stop word. The patient means something very interesting. So when you look at patient and coma together, the uses of those two words, that means a very, very negative sentiment in a very sarcastic way you're putting it across. Sarcasm is very hard to detect by the way. Okay, so in the Amazon use case, patient is not a stop word. But if you look at a, a medical journal where you're reading, uh, you know, let's say you're looking at textual data from a medical journal, the word patient will be used left, right, center. It's a very common word there. Okay, so patient by itself doesn't convey anything there. <clears throat> Okay. So very important to understand domain wise uh, what stop words might mean. Okay. So, so now you do a word count. Basically you look at a document count. How many times that particular word is coming here? How many times the word cat is coming? One, one, two, two. Straightforward. And what you have done right now, we have converted our review data into a document or matrix. All of this is one line of code. I'm going to show you the code in a second. All of this is one line of code document term matrix and this is what we call <coughs> DTM. You convert this into a document term matrix and that's your DTM. Document term matrix, uh, uh, you've got documents along the rows and you've got terms along the columns. Terms are basically tokens. Think of it like tokens. Tokens are, are, are uh, the smallest individual element of a word, uh, you know, of, of a textual uh, data. Tokens are the tokens or terms are the smallest individual element of a textual data. Those tokens could be words, or those tokens could be, you know, the, these tokens could either be words, or those tokens could be <coughs> individual characters. The tokens are the smallest individual elements of a uh, smallest individual elements of a, a text. The character tokens are also there. Sometimes they get used, 
and you even have sentence tokenization right the most default one is word tokenization which you have done right now but there can be use cases where you do sentence tokenization where you're looking at groups of sentences as a whole or you might have use cases of character tokenization where you're trying to track okay uh, uh, what is the like how frequently are certain characters used and there are very interesting correlations you find there also by the way guys like for example if you're looking at emails you will have a lot of rich information coming out of vowels i would like to probably track how many times vowels are being used maybe spams have a lot to do with some of those aspects okay <clears throat> again there are some related details that you have there but read about it so just to clarify tokenization can happen in multiple ways you can look at uh, uh, maybe character tokens word token sentence tokens but here we are looking at the most common kind of tokenization the default is word token so you want to break it up uh, as words so every word <clears throat> every unique word will come up here and that's the uh, term and the documents will basically come along the rows right now each document is a review it can be a facebook post it can be a twitter tweet it can be an amazon uh, review it can be a book it can be an article it can be an imdb review anything for that matter okay imdb review you want to look at rotten tomatoes you want to train a model based on that you can do it possible you can get a lot of rich information out of that by the way okay so now it is done <clears throat> everything is set uh, remember this is the yelp data set so we already have a uh, a sentiment column available here senti the sentiment column there goes my features there goes my outputs and hey like everything is set we've got information that is in a input output format and we can use our algorithms pretty much what we discussed yesterday what kind of algorithms are we going to use classification right you build a classification model <clears throat> and uh, you're going to do some function mapping between sentiment with uh, the features right now okay we're going to learn a model out of that okay it's pretty much how the whole thing will work out how do you do it in code what is the so the, the only thing to remember is convert a textual data <clears throat> convert the textual data into a document term matrix format dtm format convert this textual data into a dtm format document term matrix format this is pretty much what you end up with okay so in code quick two minutes on this guys what we are doing here is we are we are segregating our okay, let me read this in once again we are segregating our uh, five stars and one stars as you can see right now the yelp data set originally consists of different types of reviews so as it is originally the yelp data set consists of different types of reviews there are one star two star three star five star everything but what we are doing for our uh, use case we are only considering five star and one star reviews you can question me sign why you are doing that the reason i am doing that is to make the process simple otherwise it becomes a slightly difficult process and i'll tell you why it becomes difficult uh, the reason is because the reason it becomes difficult is because uh, it is extremely hard to classify between one and two extremely hard because if you rated somebody good <clears throat> and if you rated somebody very good finding out the difference in four and five is very hard <laughs> it's possible but in my basic modeling that i am doing i'm teaching you something very basic like right nlp just how to approach it with this kind of model we cannot do it for that we have to use lstm models for that rnn lstm models okay basic count vectorizer will not help us that which is why i'm ignoring that complexity i'm just sticking to extremely good review and extremely bad review this segregation we can do beautifully which i'll show you right now okay anyway so separate out your x separate out your y uh, we have ignored everything else right now we are only considering our uh, text please ignore everything else right now <clears throat> so there goes our text which is x and there goes our stars which is y okay so this is my x and this is my y there goes my text and there goes my stars so that's my x and that's my y and all that we are doing is we are basically doing a train test split uh, x, ten, x, x test y train y test is the standard process now this is a standard machine learning workflow we have entered the only problem that we are going to face here is uh, <coughs> this part now the x part we have to kind of somehow convert it to a numeric format okay but but here onwards is all machine learning the only new thing that we are learning here is how do i convert that x into uh, a numerical format because if you look at my x train right now just to clarify if you look at my x train right now what is my x train my x train right now is just textual data now we have to what we have to do is we have to convert this review this all these uh, uh, 3064 reviews you are seeing okay <laughs> absolutely disgusting the person didn't like the food probably okay <laughs> so uh, you're going to convert all these 3064 uh, reviews into this kind of a format right now okay that's pretty much what we are trying to do and how do we do that how do we do that let's see that the code is uh, tokenization 
and this is the way to do it count vectorizer okay count vectorizer to create document term matrices from x train and x test this is the way we actually do it so you already have x train you already have x test remember this is one more feature engineering technique just like your standard scalar and you know other things that we have seen the polynomial features you are doing it only on the features not on the outputs so once again you will do a, a vect fit transform on your x train and the vect transform on your x test pretty much what we talked about yesterday very similar to the process we talked about yesterday right you you're basically from your x train you're creating the x train dtm and from your x test you're creating the x test dtm if you want to see what your x train dtm looks like little hard to show you directly right away because this is a sparse matrix and i'll talk a little bit about that in a second but uh, x train dtm is a <clears throat> is basically having 16825 columns right now 16825 columns and that's pretty much the dimensionality of what you have learned so originally my uh, i had reviews with me and uh, how many unique words have you figured out from all these reviews you have figured out 16825 unique words that means you have created 16825 such columns right now so a pretty big data set we are actually dealing with and these are some examples of features that we have got you can take a look at it uh, people write all sorts of shit in their reviews okay so it's the yum yummy yummer and we can see all, even see how dirty data can actually get in an actual review right so see data can actually get very very dirty in text i've not done any pre processing right now i'm just going on as it is but remember in more practical scenarios you do want to make sure that yuma yum yummy yummy or yumminess yum yum yummer and all the ways you write yum and yummy and whatever you write all these mean the same thing these are all spelling mistakes you can say but whatever that is if i do not pre process this i would have ended up creating 30 columns for the same word they all mean yum yummy that's a that's a stem word we are talking about they all mean yummy but now what i'm doing is i'm creating 30 different columns just because i didn't not handle that particular feature and what will happen if you end up creating too many redundant columns what is that issue kind of called overfitting pretty much what we saw in our sales use case if you recall the sales advertising use case like we have tv we have radio we have newspaper and with newspaper you're like when you include the newspaper feature you're getting a you're getting a very very poor model so uh, again like the idea is if you create too many uh, bad quality features then you will get a very very highly overfit model in a way okay this is what my data frame looks like just wanted to show you <clears throat> this is what we have built this is our document term matrix pretty much what how we built it right now okay so x train dtm two array function we are using and this is what we get so these are the 3064 reviews and against each review you are basically uh, having each of these unique words and if you see remember there was a term i i used some time back called a sparse matrix and this is an excellent example of what a sparse matrix looks like so what you are staring at right now is a sparse matrix and why do we call it sparse because most of these values are actually zero most of these values are zero very few values are ones most of these numbers are zero and what it means is uh, it, it kind of means that if you look at any one particular review if you if you look at any one particular review a person will not use all possible words all possible words will not be used in that review that's a way to intuitively understand uh, this thing so all possible words will not be used in the review so uh, there are there are 16825 uh, possible words like you write a review will you write will you use all 16825 words no you will hardly use 50 100 words guys okay and that too you will repeat many words like am is the filler words will come so normally normal reviews you will maximum use 100 words you imagine going to amazon even if you write a detailed review if you love the product and you love the book or whatever the hell you like 1000 words take 1000 words okay that also is very big okay so you know 16825 words you will definitely not use so this is so most of these values will be zeros and very few of these numbers will be equal to ones maybe some some number here some number here will be equal to one and that's the way to look at the column names are hidden right now you can you can print out the column names also because we already know the feature names right feature names you already know this is your feature names you can see vect uh, vect dot get feature names so because you already know your feature names you can print out uh, these these things you can you can put it out and you can see exactly what it kind of looks like okay <clears throat> all right so coming to the modeling side of things this pretty much i think now the job is mostly done coming to the modeling side of things let's get this out of the way uh, quickly we are looking at the modeling side uh, 
at this point in time, we have got our input output combinations and all we have to do is we have to use an algorithm to build a model. And specifically for textual data, I'm teaching you one more spe special kind of algorithm called naive base, which is a probabilistic uh, kind of algorithm. Uh, the mathematics is based on probabilities, which again is a different thing altogether. But specifically from a, from a workflow point of view, all that we are doing is uh, use this particular algorithm. It's called multinomial naive base algorithm, which is very, very popularly used for textual data. And besides that is the usual workflow that we have followed until now. So dot fit, dot predict. There's no difference in this part compared to what you've learned. Okay, so fit your model on your training data and, 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 and predict on the basis of your testing data, you get a score method. You can ignore this initial part, this accuracy score, one more way to do it, but you can just stick to the test accuracy, what we talked about, 91.87 test accuracy out of the box using basic uh, document or matrix techniques, okay? Uh, can we do a deeper analysis of this? Yes, we can. Uh, just take another quick two, uh, two to three minutes on this. Uh, but just to kind of clarify that the ML workflow part will remain very, very similar here. So this part will not change. So pretty much the ideas that you have learned until now will remain very, very similar. Can you look at the predict probas? Yes, you can. <clears throat> you can look at the predict probas here. So predict probas will tell you the probability of uh, positive and the probability of uh, negative. So these two numbers correspond to what? <clears throat> if you look at this right now, maybe we can look at one example. One example we can talk about. So we can look at maybe this example. <clears throat> so the probability of, this is one, this is five. Okay, so probability of five star is how much? 99.97%. So the model predicted 99.97% is a five star rating. And hey, the actual probability is also equal to five. The actual rating is also equal to five. That's what model predicted. And I think the review also means that the person is very happy. So greatness in the form of code, just like the whatever that is, okay. So these are some beautiful ways to analyze uh, this whole thing. And you can also look at the, probably the, you know, probably the second last review where the person is, Kind of very unhappy. <laughs> so obviously, you know, typically this happens. No, this is, this is human psychology, guys. Very interesting. I and mean, if you have seen this kind of data, if you work with it, you will probably know that. <laughs> and you start with this kind of pattern. No, firstly, I'm sorry. This review is lengthy. You're you're using negative words right up front. No, you're sorry, and your review is lengthy. I mean, moment the model detects these kind of things, you know, hundred percent yes person is about to say something okay so these are some beautiful patterns that you're seeing you don't need a model our model is already trained in our brains right <laughs> but using machine learning also uh, the classification model is already trained <clears throat> and the model says what is the probability of one star the probability of one star is almost 100 percent what is this e00 e00 means 10 power 0 100 percent and the probability of five star is 10 power minus 19 is almost close to zero very small so probability of one star is very high. Model predicted one star and person is also very unhappy, we can say. Okay. So this is the way to look at it. But one of the things that you cannot do here is, uh, as I said, like there can be with some very, very close calls, but that will not come here. <clears throat> so because we are, remember we have removed the two star, three star and four star kind of uh, reviews. So, so we'll get a pretty robust and pretty uh, awesome classification model from this. Okay. Now, my question to you guys will be on the confusion matrix. I know we spent some time on this yesterday. So quick two minutes with all of you on this one. So this is one star, this is five star, this is one star, this is five star. So please tell me your findings and your thoughts on what you're seeing on the screen right now. How do you read this? How do you evaluate your classification model right now on the basis of what you're seeing? Anybody? Take a guess, guys. Not the obvious thing, but we all understand what is precision, we all understand what is recall. I'm not asking for what is the confusion matrix. We all know that we have all studied that. I'm asking for what is interesting that you're observing right now. Anything that is interesting. So out of uh, 25 is the false negative, uh, which may be kind of inter okay. interpret the sarcastic review. Okay. Okay. Maybe. Okay. okay. False negative is coming here. Okay. So, uh, all right. So 25. Okay. So 25 such cases are there where, see, actually you cannot uh, directly say false negative here, but maybe we can say that. Uh, so 
here you have to kind of if you're looking at false positive false negative that way then we have to define it this way we are saying that okay five corresponds to uh, positive and five corresponds to positive and one corresponds to negative so yeah from that perspective we can probably put that nomenclature but yes you're right i mean from that perspective you can possibly say that 25 false negatives that model predicted model predicted negative but in reality uh, you know the prediction is false now think about it logically now Praveen since you mentioned that like uh, in this domain what is more costly for me is false negative more costly or is false positive more costly think about it from a customer sentiment analysis point of view what is more costly from business standpoint <laughs> Any, any thoughts like not false, only to you or nothing generally false, false positive because false it positive. may defame or create a bad uh, scene so but you're saying model predicted uh, positive you you predicted review is very positive but in reality uh, you know review was not so that's a dangerous thing as Harish also right he said yes correct exactly false positive is dangerous is dangerous so false positive means you are missing out a negative review that means somebody spoke very uh, poorly against you in in that see Amazon brand page, let's say if OnePlus, uh, you know, Seven is selling its smartphones, they will have Amazon review. You know how closely that's being monitored. All the brands are very conscious about Amazon, right? And and Amazon even will delist certain products if the reviews are uh, uh, bad. So even Amazon will have a robust uh, sentiment analysis modeling uh, put in place. <clears throat> so that's what they are doing day in day out, right? So if the model predicted that review is uh, good, but in reality review is bad, that is unacceptable. From an Amazon perspective, from any perspective, that is unacceptable. I, I don't want to predict it is good and reality is bad because I miss out a bad review. I don't want to miss out on bad reviews, right? I'm okay to miss out on good reviews, but I'm not okay to miss out on bad reviews. What is false positive? Uh, what is false positive? False negative. False negative means model predicted review is negative, but in reality it's not, which is okay. Which is okay. It's just an extra manual effort for the content team now. Because see what happens in Amazon kind of use cases is it's, it's not like a completely automated thing. See, most of the discussion and argument against AI is it's totally automated. No, it's not. Okay. Most of these are assisted uh, mechanisms that we have today. In Amazon use case also there will be data scientists at Amazon. Okay. So what happens is uh, let's say uh, somebody posts some review about some comment about you. So the model will predict, okay, there is a 70% probability it is negative and it will flag it for you. And now you review it, you do a manual review now. You're not wasting time on anything. You're just saying, okay, let me focus on what the model thinks is important for me. Now it's a second level check for you. That's it. Okay, that's it. It's an extra effort for you. If it's false negative, that means model predicted negative. But in reality, it's not. It's fine. Good deal. I mean, that's okay. I mean, it's an extra effort, but it's not, it's not as bad as false positive. It's not as bad as false positive, right? So false positive is extremely bad right now in this context. And what you are seeing very interesting is on the contrary actually in this case false positive is actually higher so our model although this is a beautiful way to understand these things you know like although the accuracy as a whole is coming out very nice and we are all excited okay 90 percent you know wonderful hey like look at the false positives right now what else okay aside from that part what else what else are you seeing this is very interesting some other interesting patterns we are seeing here anything else that you're seeing right now all of you are able to get it. Right? Yes or no, guys? Are you all following? Yes. <laughs> You've been very silent, everybody. I've only been hearing from Praveen and Harish. And what about the rest of you? Are you all following? Yes, yes or no? Is this clear, everybody? Uh, is it clear? Any doubts? Yes or no? <laughs> okay. How about the rest of you? Any doubts? Anybody up to this point? So what, what what else? Let me hear from somebody else other than Harish and Praveen. Somebody else must answer now. Okay. What what else? What else is interesting uh, right now? Take a guess. Take a guess. What else do you see very interesting coming out in the classification report as you see this? Take a guess. Take a guess, guys. Look at the classification report. See what else is striking out right now. Anybody? Okay, just, just the 30 seconds I'll give you. Take, take some time, think over it, that's okay, think over it.
So, okay, anybody? Floor is open. Anybody wants to uh, go in? Anybody? So the actuals in yes. case of uh, one is yes. uh, low. The recall is 0.68. Okay. Okay. Very interesting. So what is it? Why do you think the recall is low for one? Any thoughts about that? Why is the recall low for one plus? <clears throat> that means that means it's a very good point. You're actually in the right track. So I was, I was, my, 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 my answer and my expected answer was on those lines as well. Uh, but Somebody has to complete that. So out of 100 negative reviews, the model detects only 68 of them. What's the reason? Why is the reason that for one class, the recalls and even precisions are also pretty poor? That's generally what is happening here. Uh, five star is, is doing very well. You can see the five plus classification is happening pretty well. And this is the benefit of looking at class level accuracy. Accuracy by itself is a pretty useless metric. Now you're able to look at class level accuracy. You know what is the precision and recall of the individual classes. Now we know exactly what's going on behind the scenes. So what's the reason why the recall for the one class is uh, low? Any thoughts, anybody? The answer is hidden here itself. <laughs> no calculation required. The answer is present in front of you. So go back to the machine learning uh, process. Like what is machine learning? How do machines learn? Machines learn from data, right? Isn't it? So if the model is not doing well, most likely, there's not enough data available. And if you look at one class, only less amount of data is there. There's only a one is to eight ratio. <clears throat> the ratio that you're seeing right now, that's a one is to eight ratio that you're seeing between the, you know, the, uh, the one class and the five class. Make sense? Yeah, but on the other hand, the prediction is high. Uh, how would we interpret that? Come again, Harish. Uh, the prediction seems to be high for one precision. So, uh, okay. Yeah. So for that, you have to, I mean, so again, like, uh, yeah, so j I'm just giving a very generic analysis. Actually, see the way to look at it practically when you're solving these classification problems as we discussed yesterday, you will generally look at F1 score. See, otherwise it becomes more like, okay, should I look at accuracy? Should I look at precision or recall? But we should generally look at F1 score A and B right now, what is, you know, so yes. So if you're asking me precision is high, Precision high basically is one of the reasons is because again, it, there's a mismatch happening, right? There's a mismatch happening in how many predictions it's doing in the first place. If you look at the one class, if you look at the one class, anyways, it is doing this many predictions. Number of predictions also is doing less, no? So, so the, 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 the way to intuitively understand this thing is, if you have less examples to learn from, let me give an example to you. I think. Let's say you have a, this is a small kid and you're teaching the kid examples of apples and bananas. You've taught the kid 10 examples of apples and only one example of banana. The, apple, the, chip, the kid has seen lots of apples, but only one banana. Next time the kid sees anything, it will be more likely to predict apples. Make sense? So here also, you're more likely to predict that class. You're more likely to predict that class, which you've seen more often. That's what you're seeing here as predict. So, so if you have seen five class more often, naturally the number of predictions for five will also be better, more, which is why if the denominator is more, here the denominator is less, the precision is increasing in a way. That's the, that's the intuitive way to look at it. And, and, and this is what we refer to as imbalanced class problem. You will find it everywhere in classification. Take care, talk about any business context. You will almost always find this imbalanced uh, class issue. <clears throat> What is imbalance class uh, issue? Imbalance class basically means, you know, like in a way it kind of means that there are a uh, lot of examples for one class, but there are very few examples for the other class. You talk about equipment failure, a server failure. There are very few instances servers would have failed, but there are a lot of instances servers would not have failed. And now we are talking about balancing the data. So how do you handle these kind of imbalance classes in real life scenarios? So should you use data as it is like this? So A, you should try to balance it out, try to collect more data for positive and negative reviews, try to equalize and you know try to have equal amount of number of data so that the model learns in an equal way. The model learns in a symmetrical way. Otherwise it will be like, you know, you have a small kid at home, you're teaching the kid only apples, but no mangoes. Next time you show a fruit teacher, is, uh, kid is like, okay, what is a mango? You have not even taught me. I don't even know what a mango looks like. Here also the same thing. You've taught the kid lots of examples of five stars, very few examples of one stars. 
I don't even know what a one star looks like. How can I even predict a one star? That's the way to look at it. <clears throat> and, and how do you practically handle these things? We use something called SMOTE. SMOTE is a technique that we can use to handle uh, imbalanced uh, classification. <clears throat> so very interesting idea. So what SMOTE tells you is, uh, given you have data like this, given you have data like this, let's say your distribution uh, initially is like this. And by the way, what I've opened up right now is a very interesting blog, very good blog. Uh, so I think I've talked about towards data science with all of you. I've talked about uh, uh, a few blogs. So this is another very good blog. Machine Learning Mastery it talks about a lot of awesome concepts and stuff. Okay. So please do refer to it. Yeah. So you can see, uh, this is my distribution of data right now. Lots of uh, blue classes, very few orange classes. If you try to build a classification model, the model give, will give very poor F1 scores. F1 scores will be less. That means low, low precision, low recall. F1 scores will be less. And now what you try to do is, you try to synthetically increase your uh, orange. How do you synthetically increase your orange part? The way to do that is, you go back and do it like this. This is the way to synthetically increase your orange part. It's more tape. You're trying to synthetically increase or synthetically oversample the minority component. That means you're artificially creating more orange points around that orange. Artificially creating data. Okay. And uh, very interesting, you can see right now, after doing that, your performance will be much, much better. Your overall model performance will actually improve. And this is, what kind of strategy is this called? It's called an oversampling technique. It's called oversampling. So we also have something called undersampling. Although undersampling, we don't practically do a lot. So here oversampling will look like, uh, you try to oversample the minority class. That means there are total 184 records. You try to make it 838, 838. That is an example of oversampling. So both will become 838. You, you'll additionally synthetically create more data points so that they become 838 records each. What is undersampling? Undersampling is like a lesser favored option where you basically reduce the number of records of five star to 184 each. So again, this is not preferred because you're, you're reducing data in a way. So why would I want to do that generally? But you still have it as a strategy, undersampling. And that's the way to practically handle data imbalance issues. But aside from that, it gives you a good understanding on how uh, to go about classification in these contexts. And just to have a sense of A, how to handle structured uh, you know, unstructured data and how do you work with unstructured data. But uh, the most important thing is that the crux of classification, the crux of machine learning that we have talked about until now, the processes that goes into it, the concepts that we have learned, the workflows that we have discussed, fit transform, training, testing, accuracy, precision, confusion matrix, all of those things remain the same. Nothing changes. Most importantly, take your textual data and convert it to a uh, some kind of a numeric format. Images work the same way, guys. If you talk about image data, if you ask me, Sian, how do we work with image data? We don't use traditional ML uh, for that, but image data is basically what we use, uh, you know, like <clears throat> we use deep learning libraries like computer vision, uh, you know, like Keras is stuff we use for that, that kind of work. So we can use OpenCV as well, but uh, the, crux of, the crux of image data is what? How do we handle image data? We handle image data by converting image into numbers. The most important thing is how do you convert that particular feature, that particular uh, data set into numbers, numerics. And once you do that, you can uh, start applying your ML algorithms exactly the way we have learned it. Yes, the pre-processing aspects will change, I agree. You cannot use the same histograms or the same bar charts and stuff. So that's a very different thing. For textual data, we use word clouds and stuff, which is again very different. Uh, but just to clarify, the process of ML will remain roughly the same. But yes, EDA, when you're doing exploratory analysis, when you're probably looking at uh, different issues in data, those kind of aspects might change in, in different. So images, we look at different types of things. Text, we look at different types of things. So those aspects will change. But otherwise, broadly, the workflow will remain very, very similar. <clears throat> you can use something called Spacey. I've given a, a very interesting demonstration of one more, a very, very popular uh, machine learning library called Spacey, which I'll just show you for a second. Uh, very interesting, actually. <laughs> the way Spacey works. Give me a second, just, just gonna bring it up for you guys. Give me a second here. So I have a very simple demonstration planned here, which I just wanted to show you the power of natural language, the way it's growing. Uh, so just wanted to give you a slightly more robust example. Give me a quick second here. So let's just get it up for you. Spacey is another library that we use here. It's another library that we use for, uh, again, basic natural language processing. It's a production scale production scale library that we use. Much of, much of NLP that you do in the real world, 
uh, you'll be using spacey gensim and other libraries that use for nltk natural language to, natural language toolkit if you go back to the yelp classification problem if you go back to the yelp classification problem there was one particular uh, thing that we use for nltk what is nltk nltk stands for nltk basically stands for natural language toolkit that's the only new part that we learned everything else was in sk learned by the way natural language toolkit nltk okay and there goes spacey 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 is one more library that we use so i'm going to quickly go back to my google collab because uh, it's always good to use collab for all these demos and stuff uh, what is collab what are open right now uh, remember on the first day we did our demos on kaggle kaggle was a virtual machine free virtual machine very powerful vm we got and uh, you know google is not far away from this google also offers something called google collab you can all access it for free as long as you have a google account right <laughs> so google collab free virtual machine again and very very popular i would say So in fact, this came before Kaggle. So this this was available before Kaggle in a way. So Google Lab has been there for quite some time. So you can use it. I'm going to quickly run the Spacey part here. Pip install. Let me quickly download the language model here. See, it's connecting, allocating me a virtual machine here right now. And 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 the best part about Google Lab is that uh, uh, what I can do is you can see I have opened my Google Drive right now, and and this is very interesting because you don't have to. now you guys don't have to manually you don't have to manually go back and download it and you know all that because i have already shared a google drive link with you right you can directly click on the shared with me section so in case you are trying to open it up from your drive you can directly go to shared with me just click on the shared with me then you will find this particular folder you no know? and then all you can do is you can double click on spacey you can double, see the initial uh, setup will take i think some time you have to link the application app actually initial setup will take time Uh, but uh, once you do the link once you do the linking you can straight away open with google collab if this does not show if this does not show you have to uh, connect more apps see for me uh, for me google collab will actually show here because i've already done the done the linking so if you are doing it for the first time then you have to do a linking once so how do you do that you just say connect more apps if you click on connect more apps you can, you can google will take you to their uh, you know uh, get a prompt here and just try to do a initial linking and this is the G Suite Marketplace. You can you can kind of uh, connect some apps to it, and here you can just search for Collab. You can just search for Collab right now. So you can just search for Collab or whatever collaboratory you can just search for Google Collaboratory, and you can just uh, work with that display. Collab. Just search for it, Collab, and you get it. It's already installed, but in case it's not coming for you, you can just uh, click on it and you can just install it. Just click on it once. That's it. That way you can just sync it up once. And once you do, next time you open up the Google Drive, every time this uh, will appear. Just for people who are just doing it for the first time, actually. Let's take a quick minute to get this up and running. and what i wanted to show you i think it's going to take a minute to run it's still trying to load the language model actually it's a very very big language model 827 mb which is trying to download from the uh, in, in so it's it's taking some time i think i'll just wait for it to complete in the meantime uh, what i wanted to convey i'll keep this running maybe uh, we'll we'll just circle back in five minutes and just discuss it again it's still running as you can see uh, okay so let me just execute this thing and what i wanted to show you were two specific aspects of this one was the concept of part of speech tagging what is part of speech tagging pos tagging part of speech tagging basically means that you can give any text as input and the model will basically classify uh, what 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 parts of speech it belongs to so normally when we talk about classification we generally talk about you know uh, we talk about predicting sentiment detecting whether the review is a fake or not things like that right but this is another kind of uh, classification we are trying to do in a way so i i just give any sentence and and i think once this loads i can show you some okay installing it is it's installing now just take another minute for it to complete so once it does that uh maybe you can just keep this part running till here okay, it's almost done you can now load the language model i think it is complete in a minute okay yeah perfect it's done okay let me just show you 
I'm just loading the language model now. So load Stacy, there it goes. Stacy, and I'm just loading this particular text, Moody Downgrade India, okay, or whatever, I can give anything, okay. So, and it is giving, giving this particular text, and you can use the pre-built pre language model, pre-built language model for part of speech tagging. Okay, it is not rule-based AI. It's not that the model is seen this. See, I can give, uh, you know, like, I, I don't know, like I can give Shine as a teacher, whatever. So obviously, Google will not, you know, learn based on that. Let's say I became a teacher today. How will Google know? Is it a training data Google has got? Of course not. It's not rule-based AI, okay? I can give any sentence. It's a Shine as a teacher or whatever. I mean, the part of speech will run. Okay, so you can see now and, you know, like, let's say, uh, is it, running. Is running. Okay. And it will work out beautifully actually. It will work out beautifully and you can see verb, you know, proper noun. This is a proper noun. Okay, it's the way to look at it. It's preposition, right? <laughs> and you can even see the dependencies. The display map will also show beautifully and you can see the, uh, so so who is running? So sign is running and is running. So this is a dependency that you can also kind of uh, get a sense of. This is the, dep this, uh, the dependency uh, tree that you can also get to see. Okay, and finally, name entity recognition. Okay, so this is the kind of classification that we are doing. You can take any sentence and you can kind of classify uh, what kind of, what kind of, uh, you know, parts of speech it falls under. And you can give any other sentence, let's say, uh, N-E-R, named entity recognition. And you can give any sentence, let's say, my name is Shine, and let's say, uh, whatever, I mean, let's say, uh, we are having, whatever, you know, let's say, my name is Shine. Obviously, it's not a, it's not a trained model, right? It's not a trained model, like a random model, we are look, uh, random, uh, you know, uh, text we are looking at right now. And I can give that text and the model will try to classify what are the different components it sees out of that. Okay. So let's say uh, I can say I am, you know, let's say I am, let's say I can actually say I am 30 years old. Okay, let's say approximately. Okay, so, so now it will also say, it will probably also go back and say that, hey, like 30 years old is the date. It's not perfect. You can see it's not perfect. Uh, this is not exactly what I was expecting. Uh, but it's doing something, right? It's, just, it's doing something. Okay. Maybe to say I am visiting. I will visit Singapore, let's say, I don't know, let's see. It, it's not perfect, once again, it's not perfect, but it does, so you can see, very interesting. Singapore is a, is a place, it's a location, it's a country, and the model automatically picks up, and it says it's a country. Okay, so uh, let's say if I, if I just use the term Reliance here, Reliance is an organization, most likely it will, it, will, it will say it's an organization. Look at this, wonderful, it says it's an organization. So there's some pre-built metadata it already has. It's, a, it's not, it's not rule-based AI, but it's trying to learn something from uh, you know what I'm saying okay think of that way. great so uh, <clears throat> that's about Stacy please use Colab I think you will enjoy Colab quite a bit it's very simple use it from your Google Drive and it's very easy to share stuff with people let's say I make some changes I can click on share and as long as I have a Google account I think the collaboration is just seamless here okay. cool guys let's take a quick break let's take let's get some tea coffee now let's take a quick break let's come back let's circle back and we'll uh, look at uh, another quick 15, 20 minutes of uh, comparative analysis of a few algorithms with respect to a case study. And from there, we will get to unsupervised clustering use cases. Okay, Again, through a couple of case studies we'll take up. Okay, so we can take a break. We can uh, circle back by uh, 4.55. Okay, I'll see you back at 4.55 once you.
all right so let's get started guys so uh, let's get a move on and let's quickly come back and look at a very interesting case study which i'll present to you and on the basis of that we will also look at a couple of other aspects of the supervised learning workflow a uh, couple of other advanced aspects of a supervised learning workflow and uh, we 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 we'll move on from there all right so <clears throat> one of the first things i want to talk about with all of you uh, let me just quickly share this part with you just give me a second <clears throat> So what I'm getting into right now is this concept called cross validation. You would have heard me mention this couple of times before as well. Uh, we we might have heard of this thing called cross validation, cross validation, cross validation. And now we'll talk about what is this thing called cross validation. Okay, so let's let's try to understand what this cross validation actually means. Okay. all right so here it goes i'm presenting my screen now uh, one of the challenges that we have faced until now the same data set by the way which i'm taking so one of the challenges that we have kind of talked about until now is this concept of random state right so what is the issue with random state guys the issue with random state is if you use a particular random state what will happen like you might get a good performance or you might not like it depends right if, i mean it really depends on your uh you know the use case so so random state by itself the problem is if your testing data is good if your testing data is good you might get a good accuracy if your testing data is not good you may not get a good accuracy that's the problem with random state so random state is a very random splitting that you're doing of your training and testing data and the whole idea is on your training data you're building a model and on your testing data you're evaluating your model so it does not really give a true picture of how good your model actually is right so i'll give a simple analogy to help you understand this concept let's say you 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 prepared some topics from your textbook and then you are uh, solving a question paper and i ask you how much marks have you got so just on the basis of marks that you received on one question paper i'm trying to make an opinion about you that is incorrect so just on the basis of one test data set i'm trying to say how good you are that's the problem with using a plain vanilla random state in machine learning so this is where we are saying that hey instead of judging a person based on one test accuracy why not we why not we have many 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 different test sets in fact why not we simulate 10 different test sets why not we simulate 10 different accuracies and let me calculate the average out of these 10 different accuracy will that not be a better estimate yes is it so it's like saying that hey let me have you solve five or 10 different question papers and out of all those 10 different question papers i want to evaluate how will you do on an average across the 10 different question papers i don't care about your performance on one paper or the second paper or the third paper but i want to see on an average how you perform across all 10 different question papers and that idea is basically what we call cross validation the technicality is aside this is the broad idea i wanted to import why it is important and how it's important and this is the way you actually do it if you only look at random state random state will give you 72% test accuracy as you can see just a single test accuracy you're getting but does this really reflect how this model is performing not necessarily if i if i use a different test set i might get a different answer so instead of calculating a single accuracy use something called cross validation score code is one line and now what you end up getting is you basically get 10 different accuracies now x comma y cv equal to 10 scoring equal to accuracy you can use recall precision also by the way we talked about these metrics you can evaluate based on recall as well by the way so now you get average recalls now you get uh, 10 different precisions and you can also get 10 different f1 scores i'm just using accuracy as an example right now This is a far more robust way of building models, and what is the benefit of doing this? What is the benefit of doing this? Now we are basically saying that hey, I am solving ten different question papers. So whatever model I created, whatever algorithm I have got, I am using that to to solve ten different question papers, and I am getting an average accuracy which is equal to 
uh, 73.44 with a standard deviation which is equal to 4.48 and now we are back to the mu and sigma discussion we have on day one uh, part of day two if you recall i think now this makes a lot of sense i think this is exactly how we want to evaluate models for our customers the objective of machine learning is to build models which are uh, on an average more accurate and they're also more reliable i don't want to build models which have huge standard deviation i don't want to build models which which, which sometimes are giving me 100% accuracy other times they are giving me 0% accuracy it's almost like a very unreliable cricket player no i don't want models like that i want models which are on an average very accurate and the standard deviation is also kind of very low which is kind of like it is more like virat kohli kind of models you want to build or every time you come out to bat you are scoring let's say 50 or 60 at least every time the model is running in production it will give me accuracy somewhat around 99 to 98 so on an average is more accurate and also is very consistently accurate that's exactly what we look at and this this precise concept is what you call bias errors and variance errors in machine learning so next time you hear that on variance error what does variance error tell you variance error tells you how what is the deviation of my accuracy in the model what is the variance error that i'm getting since so there is high standard deviation high variance errors okay and this, this is, so so this is a sign of a reliable model 4.48 is not a lot of variance that means there is only plus minus 4% deviation i'm getting Like I'm not saying it's a great model. Diabetes dataset itself is a pretty uh, bad dataset. Not saying it's a great model, but this is a decent model. It's not like too much fluctuation I'm getting. Yes, it could be improved if I do some more feature engineering can improve it. But right now this is what we've got. Okay, it's always comparative analysis that we are trying to do. Okay, and this is what we refer to as the uh, uh, average accuracy and the standard deviation of accuracy of a model. There goes my mu. There goes my sigma. And we can do sigma by mu to calculate coefficient of variation. Okay, this is the way to do it. there is one more idea that i want to talk about this is more most of the code snippets basically i'm showing you right the code implementations i've actually uploaded this file called uh, pima india and diabetes cross validation grid search gradient boosting comparison in your uh, google drive as well it's more of a uh, more of a comparative analysis that we are seeing right now okay so if you go back to your google drive uh, i have uploaded this file as well just wanted to show you where i have so there goes the file which i have uh, kind of uploaded right now that's the gradient boosting comparison file which i have uploaded okay pima india and diabetes a uh, gradient boosting comparison just give me a second guys let's go back and close this part so there goes the file which i have uploaded okay this is the one time walking uh, walking you through right now <clears throat> okay and this is where we are right now now what is the next thing this this is one more concept i've been talking about for quite some time that sign uh, how do we go back and find out these hyperparameters there was a question one of you asked me on on that day i recall and you asked me okay how do i find out the precise value of what is these hyperparameters going to be again the algorithms are very very deep topics and you know as i said machine learning itself is a one year program that we do in some of these universities and all but we just wanted to give you the crux of the whole thing uh, but just to clarify the process that we that we use to tune these hyperparameters is called hyperparameter tuning and there are several libraries that we can apply there are several libraries that we can use to perform this automatically one of those libraries is what we call grid search tv okay so look at the code all of you the code is very simple how do you actually do it look at this all of you so what we are doing is we are saying that hey run this decision tree classifier okay and and find out the ideal maximum depth from 1 to 10 the uh, 1 to 100 maximum depth is one of those hyperparameters right so i want to find out what is the best hyperparameter for the decision tree classifier and the model automatically tells me that the best hyperparameter is uh, equal to 5 because if you recall here i was using max depth equal to 5 no you can question me why am i saying max depth equal to 5 on what basis what, how do i know this is the best why not 6 why not 7 because what what is happening is i have i have i have used something called grid search tv which is automatically evaluating across a range of those values 1 to 100 and is figuring out that okay when the maximum depth is equal to 5 or 6 or, or equal to 5 the accuracy is basically the highest and that's what i'm basically getting right now the accuracy is the highest when the uh, the overall uh, hyperparameter value is equal to 5 and that's the way to look at it that's the way to understand what grid search tv is basically doing okay again the same uh, api will work for different types of algorithms so this is specifically i'm showing you for one kind of algorithm okay if you recall this was something that we did last class with our gradient boosting if you want to do this with a gradient boosting or a random forest kind of uh, algorithm you can use that also these are all very very funny names i'm using right now but these are all different algorithms actually So all these names I'm using are basically algorithms. 
and how do you tune the hyper parameter of this algorithm so if you recall there was an n estimators that you asked me the other day okay n estimators is a hyper parameter right how do you find out the ideal value of n estimators you will use the tuning process for that you say okay between 1 to 40 please tell me what is the best value of n estimators so when the value of n estimator is 37 the learning is the best 64 accuracy i'm basically getting that's the way to understand the meaning of uh, you know uh, 64 recall i'm actually getting sorry this is the way to understand the meaning of what these hyper parameters actually are and, and you might question me fine why are you uh, maximizing recall because remember this is a diabetes use case so diabetes use case whatever classification models you're building you want to build your classification models in such a way that your uh, average uh, recall is actually maximized you want to maximize your overall average recall and that's the way to understand the gist of how you do these two things the two 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 key concepts we have seen right now one is called cross validation one is called grid search these are all add-ons to all the other things you have discussed and remember these are these are these are similar things across classification and regression so whether you do classification whether you do regression this idea does not change so it's, it's almost like saying you take the same code copy paste it put it in your uh, regression workflow the concrete the california we were doing and instead of classifier use regressor the same thing dito will work the same there's no changes required okay and instead of accurate scoring you give rmsc here r squared actually otherwise it works the same way in a way okay so this is pretty much an idea that i wanted to give you on what is cross validation the concept of cross validation and the concept of grid search db to extend on top of that to extend on top of that this is the final algorithm comparison that you basically have it's beautiful way to uh, compare different types of models and which model is good which model is not good i think you can relate to this very well right now there are several of these machine learning algorithms that we'll be using and now we can actually do a comparative analysis of which model is good and which model is uh, was not best so let me just quickly do a warnings import warnings right now and this these, these are standard templates all of you can start using for your business problems now you can use these standard templates and given you have a quick voc that you want to work on you're free to use some of these templates now you can just plug in your data set and you can you, now you can try out the algorithm you don't have to know the algorithms to know the algorithms you can go the resources i've shared with you please read from it you must know it you must understand the in-depth of it but as i said a top-down idea of machine learning is very important i've seen too many people who keep studying the algorithm only for the last for the next one year and they end up ending nowhere okay you, you will not start anywhere if you if you don't start you have to start somewhere to start somewhere it's, it's important to feel inspired about the whole thing you cannot just uh, keep thinking it's all math and it's all dangerous stuff and also you got to start somewhere okay and i see too many people being fearful of ml because it, 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 it involves math so math is not some rocket science math is doable math is understandable but there's a there's a you know there's a road map for doing that it's not just that you directly start with the math so the way you start is the way i'm teaching you so you, you, you do the basic stuff you you do a b c d e and then you go to the math part after this so you, you, now you're in a position i'm confident you can take a data set and you can start working on pocs you got all the concepts built in okay you know this is my feature this is my output you can at least start building basic models you've learned all the components you know how to do train test plate you know cross validation you know how to tune an algorithm i don't care about the algorithm itself i don't care i don't, I don't want to know the match but i can build a poc for you i can interpret the confusion matrix for you if it's a regression problem i can interpret the r square rmac for you and it's that's it i can do the model for you and if you're a good uh, uh, techie if you're if you're in if you're in application development and web development stuff if you know tech, uh, frameworks like task and django you might as well get an application out of it, a deployment part also you're aware of so those are things that you uh, are already know <coughs> okay so let me quickly uh, open up this file once again guys and just a quick two minutes on this and i'll show you a very interesting case study and from there a clustered in case study will come to okay okay so uh, let me run this same pima diabetes data set and what i wanted to show you here takes a minute to run actually this file uh, what i wanted to specifically show you here is the model comparison so let's call it supervised learning model comparison file so that you can locate it better as you see the demonstrations later on take some time to evaluate as you can see it's a model comparison file and we, we, we can actually get a sense of how the different algorithms are basically doing here and we can list out all the uh, supervised learning algorithms here one by one again remember we are following a pretty black box approach here we don't care too much about the specifics about the algorithm but we are trying to 
uh, build the models and we try to understand how good the algorithms actually are. Uh, I have tried four different algorithms right now. If you want to add on to it, you can. So probably we can add on uh, a logistic regression model, an LR model to it. These are the components that are not done yet. So logistic regression, I can just import that thing here. It's not done yet. From SK learn. Not linear underscore model import logistic regression and it's pretty much all that I wanted to add at the end okay so here this part all I will do is just put in the logistic part here maybe logistic part I want to put right in the beginning because that's a slightly <laughs> less powerful model so that's fine logistic regression and logistic regression is what we call the LR model so I'm going to put that here <clears throat> and there it goes so I want to create something like this let's see if I've covered everything I've got decision trees covered uh, this decision is the classification algorithm and random forest and gradient boosting are ensembles of addition these are ensemble models we talked about ensembles briefly what are ensembles ensembles are collection of individual models so you combine many 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 models to build an ensemble Support vector machine is a very powerful algorithm. That's another kind of algorithm that you have. And here I've added something called logistic regression algorithm. Okay. And we have something else called KNN. KNN. So KNN is also a very basic algorithm that you have. Uh, it's not something that you uh, that you use a lot. It's going to still show you the comparative uh, advantages and disadvantages of the algorithms. SK learn n neighbors. SK learn dot n. SK learn dot neighbors import k neighbors classifier. It's a classifier. See, all these have regression equivalence also, by the way. So here I'm importing the classifier version of it. And uh, everything is fine. I just need to put that in. And n neighbors is equal to, uh, just put a random number of equal to five. Uh, is it good? Is it not good? I don't know. We need to see. Okay, We need to evaluate the cross validation results of it. We'll see. We'll wait and watch how it works out. Uh, so <clears throat> the last model I want to add is the KNN pretty much put all the major classification algorithms here. So there goes my KNN model. There it goes. It will take some time to run. So you can see it's the same cross validation results I'm showing out. The average cross validation accuracy and the standard deviation of the cross validation accuracy I'm showing out. What is scoring? Scoring is accuracy of free to change it. You can make it precision recall on the basis of your use case, but I just use accuracy right now. Okay, hold on. KNN model. Uh, sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, what's that? KNN model. I think I'm not run the code properly. K is capital. K is capital, is it? Oh, okay. Huh. <laughs> All right. Yes. K is capital. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Let me run the code now. Yeah. Okay. So these are going to take. Uh, run pretty fast. SVM takes a lot of time to run. Support vector machines are one of the most uh, powerful algorithms out there. Very, very powerful. And again, there's a lot of beautiful history around SVMs. And I will highly encourage the Audacity course for you, the machine learning course I picked on the first day. Uh, so Sebastian walks you through the SVM beautifully. He talks about margins and he talks about the math. He doesn't explain any of this stuff, what you're seeing right now. But the math is beautifully explained in SVM. So please do watch it. You know, please do watch that uh, course. and. You know, you, you, you learn the math of SVM very nicely there. Okay. Math of SVM is very, very dangerous, <laughs> but it's very intuitively explained in the course there. So you, can, you can see SVM is taking a lot of time to uh, evaluate. I'll just wait for a minute. And, and what you're going to see, I'm just going to kind of extend on to it. What you're going to see after a while is you're going to see a box plot comparison of the different models. It's a very common way to compare models right now. And what you're seeing right now is a box plot comparison of the algorithms that we have. Why a box plot? Because remember, we are not looking at a uh, we are not looking at a single we are not looking at a single uh, you know uh, uh, single accuracy anymore. So we are done with that random state and just calculating a single accuracy. Now we are talking about cross validation accuracy. Okay, it's like saying I have solved ten different question papers and I got ten different accuracy numbers. And you you actually have ten different accuracy numbers if you plot out your 
you know scores you'll get 10 different accuracy scores and now what you're saying is i i i've got 10 different accuracy scores and show me the distribution of the accuracy scores for all these algorithms and tell me where it's working the best which model is giving me the best performance right now and, and what you're seeing what you're seeing <clears throat> not so surprising not so surprising you're generally able to see that <coughs> two algorithms are kind of four runners two of them are four runners and i think out of all of them like we can argue that svm and gradient boosting are the four runners out of which the gradient boosting is the best algorithm that we have why because we are able to see on an average it gives you the best performance the median is the highest okay on an average when i say average i mean the skewed distribution so median is the highest for boosting the median is the highest and you're also able to see that the standard deviation is the lowest it is not only a more accurate algorithm but it's also a more reliable algorithm it's more, not only a more accurate model but it's also a more reliable model so average is also high the average this is accuracy right the average accuracy is also high and the standard deviation the dispersion of accuracy is low this is more like a, a coli kind of model that we have but see as i told you already you it, 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 so beyond the point it's like flogging a dead horse you can't do anything better than this if you want to do anything better than this you just cannot because the data itself will not allow you to do that beyond the point you can't take it to 90 percent you cannot even if you use a deep learning model on this data you cannot take it beyond the particular point okay so this is how you can try out and you can see what is working what is not working and on the basis of that you can you can pretty much go back and build your final model this is the way you can work with it simple way to compare multiple algorithms to a box and whisker plot all right so one other uh, example i wanted to show you quickly very interesting actually i want to quickly walk you through that uh, piece once this is one more notebook i'll be sharing it's more of a more of a case study actually and it's a case study which is based on a very interesting Kaggle competition. It's a case study which is based on a very interesting uh, Kaggle competition. I'm going to straight away take you to Kaggle for a second. Give me a quick minute while I just share that link with you, Kaggle link with you. <clears throat> this competition happened in Kaggle, uh, I would say, two years back. It was a pretty po popular competition back that time. And There it goes. New York City taxi fare prediction. Okay. New York City taxi fare prediction. And this is the, what, what I'll be discussing. And I will also share some uh, couple of very interesting ideas with Uber, uh, how Uber does machine learning. Okay. Couple of quick, uh, couple of uh, quick interesting ideas on Uber. So with this example, we'll also like look at some use cases on how Uber does machine learning. So Uber's machine learning platform is called Michelangelo. Very interesting. So it's named after the you know, the very famous uh, painter. So Uber's machine learning platform is called Michelangelo. We'll be looking at uh, a few of these use cases, you know, in just the, over the next uh, 10, 15 minutes. And then from there, go to clustering. But before that, guys, uh, why don't you all take a minute, uh, please go to this link, the New York City taxi prediction link. And I would like all of you to take a quick minute to uh, read this problem. Just read what data set it is. And it's a huge data set. There are 50 million records we're talking about. So don't try to download it. Okay, so it's not download, okay. So just try to understand your problem. Try to understand what you're trying to deal with. Okay, there are 55 million rows you can see. So don't try to download it. Okay, so I've given you some samples how to go about it. But that's your that's your data set we have got. The training data set 5.3 gigs. Okay. Anyways, uh, so <clears throat> just read the problem. Understand your data. Understand your data field. Understand what kind of data you've got. Understand what you have to predict. Quick uh, two to three minutes policy on that. And then I'll walk you through the solutioning, okay? how to approach the model building process.
All right, done all of you. I think a, a quick read on what is to be done, how is to be done. I hope the problem statement is uh, okay with all of you. <clears throat> Everybody has given it an initial read, a uh, quick check with all of you. So let me quickly share with you uh, how to go about it. So I've shared a uh, interesting file with you where you can uh, kind of uh, go over it and just see the approach. It may not be the best approach, not be the only approach, but uh, this is one of the approaches that you can actually follow in this particular problem. So <clears throat> I've actually gone ahead and shared a, a, a file with you called the New York City taxi fare prediction problem. So this is the, how it's been shared in the case study folder. Uh, New York City taxi fare prediction case study. Okay, so just do a final dump of your Google Drive by the end of today. So, so uh, by tonight, all of you can just do a dump. Anyway, so what kind of data do we have here right now? Let me just quickly uh, help you with the analysis here. So what kind of data do we uh, are we dealing with right now? Uh, we've got, we've got uh, each row is basically one ride and obviously New York City, we've got different types of ride services, talk about Uber, we can talk about Lyft, but that data is anonymized, we don't know exactly where this data is taken from, but let's say this, this is, uh, this is anonymized data we've got right now and each row corresponds to one ride, you know exactly where the ride started from, the pickup uh, latitude, longitude, drop off latitude, longitude, the pickup date time, how many passengers, and finally the fare amount. That's what you're trying to predict. Okay. So it's a, it's a clear regression problem, supervised learning. We've got output data which is present. So uh, we've got a whole host of algorithms that we can start working on and we can uh, try to experiment. But remember, uh, model building is not the most difficult part here. Model building, as, as I've mentioned before a couple of times, is the is the easiest uh, you know thing in machine learning. So all you do is you take the whole data, do a train test plate, and you uh, fit a model, and it and it works. It just works. Okay, good or bad is a different problem, but it works. That's not the most important thing. The most important thing in this exercise is you have to create good quality features. You spend a lot of time doing feature engineering on this problem right now. The original features as it is, for example, latitude, longitude feature, and you know, you've got a feature called pickup date time. These features as it is are not useful. Latitude, longitude, the number as such does not tell you much, right? We've talked about regression all of you, isn't it? We talked about regression. If you recall in the California housing data set which we are discussing on day one, I clearly told you that time that latitude as a number itself does not mean a lot. Otherwise, the, the, the conversation goes somewhat like, one unit increase in latitude leads to uh, five units increase in housing value. Is it correct? Is it just because my latitude is going up, the housing value will go up? Not necessarily, because in California, if you go up, there is a very big city. If you go down, there is a very big city. So both the clusters, you know, in a way, uh, the pricing was kind of uh, changing, right? So Los Angeles and San Francisco are present in two different, uh, you know, two different levels in a way. So even longitude you cannot say. Just because my longitude increased for one unit, my housing value went up this much. So logically that does not make a lot of sense. So latitude, longitude, similarly here also, you cannot just say that because the latitude is one unit more, your prices are, your fare is going to be more. No. So what we have to do here is you have to create good quality features. So you have to tell me what kind of features you can create in this problem. Just to clarify iteration one, Iteration one, you please ignore everything. Please ignore everything. And we can start with a baseline model, okay? <coughs> so what is this? This is what we call an experiment one. We are doing a baseline model. No feature engineering, just basic null removal for data wrangling we have done. Just basic uh, iteration one we have built. And that's our baseline model right now with raw features. And what kind of a performance are we getting? R squared of 0.73, RMAC of 5.095, baseline model. Can we do better than this? Of course, yes. That's why we are, we, are, we are doing this, right? So just with a baseline model, take the features as it is, you know, you've got worthless features, by the way, timestamp feature, you know, date timestamp, you'll never use as a feature in machine learning. But with that, we are getting, you know, 7.73. So something to be, you know, something to feel good about, okay? <laughs> what else can we do? What is experiment number two gonna look like? Please tell me, what kind of features do you create in this data set? 
what do you think what kind of features should you create here right now distance based on the latitude longitude of pickup and uh, drop off very good distance is an excellent metric correct in fact uh, many types of distance metrics could be used the way companies like uber companies like ola the way they will do it is they will they will uh, pay google they will use google services google api to you know uh, for this kind of competitions right so if you want to travel from a to b so you you'll be using google apis to uh, you know evaluate how much distance you are traveling from a to b so very good distance will be an excellent metric uh, if you so google will charge a lot of money obviously but if you want to use a slightly different way of doing this if you want to do a slightly different way of doing this <coughs> there is something called open source routing machine it's an open source project it's called project osrn open source routing machine and this this actually helps you calculate the shortest path between two road networks road networks and this is a free open source project and this will give you very similar kind of performance not like uh, something very bad but obviously google is google so they have got more real time data and they've got more money obviously to spend so it's obviously very different there but you can see a small demo and you can see you can try it out there's a github github account is also there they, they share the code with them how to how you can use it okay uh, so you can try it out maybe you know we care about india let me just go to india right now right or very interesting it gives you the distances and all that right and and the best part is open source right so bangalore let's say bangalore because most of us are in bangalore right so let's say bangalore right now and there goes devan ali the airport in bangalore right so we'll take this so this is where i put one of my markers there it goes so okay so this is where i start from and the drop is going to be let's say hal this is what is what is now now is uh, uh, 3rd september thursday 5:30 peak hours right <laughs> peak hours right guys i think no longer peak hours nowadays nowadays there's no peak hours let's say you want to go all the way down to uh, you know uh, south bangalore and uh, hsr layout okay so where is hsr layout uh, okay this way it will be little bit this side i guess here So okay, anyways, leave it. I just put somewhere. Okay, not able to locate where it is. I'll lay out. Anyways, so uh, it gives you the beautiful idea about how much. Okay, my goodness, three hours. Okay, <laughs> okay. Is it is it is it, is it taking this much time now? Very surprising actually. Okay, I thought coronavirus would have reduced us reduce traffic. No, very interesting. Three hours and twenty one minutes. Are you kidding me? My God, <laughs> I think I've gone too far. I guess in a way. Yes. maybe maybe you got too far sorry <laughs> i i I've, i've gone uh, i think too far maybe i should go more towards this place yes i think i've gone towards electronic city in a way okay anyways i think this more uh, sounds more like reasonable <clears throat> but uh, just to clarify uh, osrm project you don't have to do it like a gui based way of doing things you can also obviously query their apis and you can uh, see the github handle and how to how to implement a very good uh, answer obviously distance is a very very uh, crucial metric that we can add okay so if we add distance metric we will get a very very impo- uh, high increase in r squared which we'll get uh, good so that accounts for the that accounts for the pickup uh, longitude latitude so instead of using latitude longitude features tell me how much distance i'm traveling very good what else pravin says peak time very good peak time can be incorporated so maybe time stamp as a feature is a worthless feature so the time stamp is a worthless feature so pickup date time by itself it adds no value so uh, from that pickup date time why, why don't i create features like uh please tell me you know like please tell me what time of the day was it and maybe what day of the week was it these could be two very very important uh, features right so two things so a what time of the day was it and b what day of the week was it so date time stamp as it is is not important but i want to know a what time of the day was it and b what day of the week was it <clears throat> if i know it's a it's a weekday versus a weekend i'll have a very very strong uh, relationship and if i know it's a I mean, it's like like what we saw right now. It's like a peak hour. It's a peak hour, five o'clock versus the like non-peak hour, twelve o'clock. It will again be a very very strong relationship you will get with respect to the fare. Okay. Okay. Very good. Excellent. Let's let's try a couple of iterations right now. So experiment number one. Uh, I think I was not not so proud, but let's see. Uh, after adding a couple of temporal features, what we get. So these are what we call temporal features, by the way, guys. Uh, technically, we call it temporal features. Whenever you are presented with any date time columns. Uh, anything that corresponds to date time whenever you got any date time columns you will always uh, convert them to uh, some kind of 
you know kind of temporal features like extract the year the month the day here we are talking about hour of the day and day of the week so similarly you will do it in other use cases also but the temporal feature related to time temporal in english means related to time and after doing that straight away we are getting a you know 77.5 look at this straight away 77.5 we started from 0.73 now r squared has improved r mc has gone down okay iteration 2 iteration 2 i add distance metric <clears throat> iteration 2 i add distance metric and by in, I, by 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 using distance metric iteration 2 by adding distance metric we have got a 5.5 percent r squared increase that's a massive improvement straight away up to 83 we started from 73 and just by adding time based features and distance based features we are at 83 remember i have not even touched my algorithm all this while we have discussed about the best data, best algorithm builds the best model. Right now, we are tweaking the data first. This is a very common way that you will, uh, you know, you will approach machine learning projects. So use a baseline algorithm. Right now, we are using something called XG boost regressor. You can see, which is a kind of a gradient boosting kind of algorithm. So keep the algorithm constant. Try to tweak your data. Try to make your data better, 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 better. Now, once you have reached that threshold, now once my data is the best kind of data that I can possibly get, once I've got better, good quality features, now you kind of try to experiment with the algorithm. Now you do that cross validation thing I showed you, uh, compare the algorithms, find out the best hyperparameters and train the best possible model. So this is the way you will uh, basically iterate. Okay, uh, what else I can possibly do here? Well, a lot, there's so much we can do possibly. We can look at, uh, <clears throat> New York City has three airports, right? You've got JFK, we've got LaGuardia, uh, and we've got, uh, uh, what's the other one? Uh, I think there's uh, Newark Airport, the three airports in New York City. So we can possibly, <laughs> you know, add airport trips as a feature. This is a good uh, good feature to add, right? So you can possibly add airport trips as a feature. So one use case of this could be like, hey, like although you're traveling the same 10 kilometers distance, let me give an example. 10 kilometers from JFK to some place and 10 kilometers from Newark to some place and 10 kilometers from Legadia airport to some place, the patterns will be very different. Because JFK is a more busy airport, maybe user development fee and you know, maybe the airport charges will be more, the parking charges will be more. So there's a lot of patterns that will be built in that fare. Ultimately, you're trying to predict fare, right? So it is not enough to just calculate how much distance you're traveling, but I also want to know which airport and where you're traveling. That is also very important for me when the modeling side of things. So, so the, the, because distance will tell you, yes, distance is proportional to time. The more the, sorry, distance is proportional to fare. The more the distance, the more the fare, no doubt. But the same 10 meters, JFK, and the same 10 meters, Legardia, very different models. Because hey, like the fares are different. JFK naturally you're paying higher fares. So I want a separate, uh, you know, feature for that also. Like which airport am I picking you up from? Which airport? And and hey, who knows? Like uh, different airports might have different uh, types of, you know, charges. Right? So you might have a toll somewhere, and other airports may not have a toll. And this, this is a generic model we're building across. Uh, across use cases, not only specific to New York City, but maybe this kind of a thing you might find more relevant for other countries. Okay, and this is one of the features we can add. So, and what other feature can we add? Okay, it's a small improvement, just to clarify, uh, you know, it's not some not some major improvement we're getting, a small improvement of 0.1%, but at that level, at that level, it's like the Olympics now. 83% to 83.1% is still an improvement. We are not going to discount that. We are going to still say, that, hey, it's still better, it's still marginally better than what I had before. Okay, still better. I'm not, not going to discount it. Still good what you're getting right now. <clears throat> okay. And finally, we can also uh, add borrow-based features. New York City, as a place, has <clears throat> you know five different boroughs. It's almost like different locations in Bangalore. You've got HSR layout, Core Bangla, Electronic City. Okay, the different places in Bangalore we have got. And now we're going to add borrow-based features, different district-based features. And obviously the most advanced borrow is Manhattan, right? You can look at this right now. We've got Manhattan, we've got uh, Brooklyn, we've got, uh, you know, Queens, we've got Staten Island, and we've got uh, the Bronx. I think it's, 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 it's obvious, like the same 10 meters, that all this while we were discussing distance and uh, time were the most important features for fair, but now it's not. Now it's the location that also matters. The same 10 meters you travel in Manhattan, and the same 10 meters you please drive in Bronx, Will you get the same fare? Of course not, because the demand is different, the people are different, the, the market is different, the economics are different. Definitely, it will not work out, right? Because that the very so the, there are like extreme uh, like there's also poverty in New York City. Okay, New York City is not some very rich place. There are a lot of rich people, and there are equally a lot of very poor people also. A lot of gap is there, and obviously it depends on where that ride is taken. Uh, you know, the economics of that will actually come into account. Okay. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> so finally, uh, after doing all these iterations, finally after all these iterations, we are down to the best possible set of features. I think uh, we were able to, I would say we were able to, <clears throat> in a way, uh, you know, get an improvement up to 83.2. We started from 0.73 with absolutely worthless features and now after doing several layers of feature engineering, we are down to 83.2. And now I can confidently say that here, here goes the best set of features. Here goes the best set of features. And on that, I will train a full fledged XGBoost model. That means I will train a full fledged model with the best hyperparameters. And that model will give me another marginal improvement. And, and that is what you're able to see. And the marginal improvement is coming out as let's say approximately around 86.5 which is a pretty drastic improvement I'm getting here. Here I'm keeping, keeping the data constant, algorithm I'm changing. So all this while I was trying to create the best set of features, feature engineering based on domain knowledge. There was no mathematical feature engineering we did by the way. You're free to use feature tools on the same data set. Please Google it out, get a handle of the feature tools uh, thing I showed you. These guys have even demonstrated this feature tools on this uh, data set and they've proven it's working actually. Very interesting, try it out later on. <laughs> but until now, we have only uh, gone ahead and done the feature engineering based on domain knowledge. So we have figured out, okay, these are the best set of features. And now let me try the algorithm. What is the best algorithm? And this is what we figured out. Okay, we, get, we started from 73 and we are up to 86.5. Can we do better? Yes, we can. Possibly we can. I mean, I would say, uh, let me include demographic information, uh, per capita GDP, you know, things like median housing value. These things are not incorporated. Like I've got location information. Yes, I know this is, Manhattan, this is Bronx, yes, but hey, like, can we get some demographic information? Can I get information of weather? Things like that. If I can incorporate more of these information, possibly I can get that extra one, two percent increase in our score. Okay, so that's one of the ways to look at it. Okay, and obviously the more data you start getting in, you have to run the service. I mean, see, it's like Uber cannot say, I will not run my company until I have the best fair prediction model. You can't do that. That's an argument that doesn't hold in machine learning. You have to start with the organization. You have to start the business, right? Day one of an e-commerce company, you will not start getting customer data. You will not have customer data. So you cannot say, no, hey, I don't have a recommendation system. The recommendation system like Amazon, it will take you a lot of time to build because Amazon has collected a huge amount of customer data. <clears throat> They've got millions of customers in that database. So Netflix will have, will have millions of uh, you know hours of customer movie watch data, movie hours data. So to get to that scale, you have to collect data. So you can't say that I will not start my business because I don't have enough data. You have to start somewhere. And I could it's the improve. That's the way to look at it. And on the same lines, what I would like to present for all of you is this very interesting uh, you know, idea of how Uber is doing machine learning. Very interesting. Uh, please read about it. I think it's just inspiring when you read something and you see companies that we, you know, that we ourselves interact with day-to-day -day basis, how they are doing machine learning. Uh, so I think it's just it's very inspiring. Okay, and as you see, many of these things are not very difficult. Like uh, pretty much many of these things are based on what you have talked about. I think you will relate to it very well. <coughs> Specifically, they talk about uh, uh, Uber Eats. If you look at it right now, Uber Eats use cases, Uber Eats estimated time of delivery model. It's a pretty complex problem, by the way. So you order some food item, and uh, Uber Eats tries to predict how much time it will take for the food to reach you. That's a pretty complicated problem. So what you are trying to do here is uh, when an Uber customer places an order, it is sent to the restaurant for processing. The restaurant then needs to acknowledge the order and prepare the meal, which will take time depending on the complexity of the order and how busy the restaurant is. There's a prediction component involved here. See, this straight away there's a prediction component. When you hit that button that I want to buy, you make the payment. The restaurant has to acknowledge and prepare the meal, which will take time depending on the complexity and how busy the restaurant is. So you have to predict how busy the restaurant is. Look at historical data, look at all similar orders customers are placed with that hotel and, and, and try to predict how much time generally it takes. <clears throat> when the meal is close to being ready, so first is the amount of time for the meal to be prepared, just to clarify, meal preparation time. So meal preparation time plus rider time and Uber delivery partner is dispatched. Then the delivery partner needs to get to the restaurant, how much time he takes, he or she takes, find the parking, how much time that is taking. See, India, there is no parking. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Okay. But generally, you, you have to do parking, right? You can't just park in the road and get the food and come. You have to park. You have to find proper parking and do that. That takes time. Okay. Walk inside to get the food, then walk back to the car, drive to the customer's location. These are all practical problems that Uber is handling. And you can already imagine the complexity that you're dealing with right now. When walk to the customer's go to complete delivery, even there is a time component involved here also. Because when you reach the customer's location, you know, like, 
the when you reach the customer's location there also you have to find parking go to the customer's door if the customer stays on the stays on the 10th floor <clears throat> there are practical considerations where you know uh, you, have, you have to understand like there, there is a time component that is involved in you reaching the 10th floor there is a kind time component that is involved in you reaching the 10th floor that component is also there and these are all things that need to be understood okay anyways uh, so this is a regression problem so what uber they do is the michelangelo platform uber each the data scientists use the gradient boosting decision tree regression uh, model very similar to the use cases that we also discussed they use they use gradient boosted uh, regressors actually to predict end to end delivery time <coughs> and you can read about the features what kind of features they use historical features real time calculated features okay? these are things that they actually can system architecture is talked about uh, there are some architectural components the kafka component involved the spark component involved okay you can read about these things what i want to show you specifically and then model evaluation obviously this is a kind of thing that you know we have this is the fitted residual training errors okay absolute errors the r squares and all will come up here i think you guys will relate well to this part okay this is the confusion matrix that you can see precision recall matrix will actually come up here confusion matrix true positive false negative okay you can see all that anyways uh, and you can see the most important features feature importance will actually show up we talked about feature importance the feature importance will also show up right now very nice is the feature importance will also show up here <clears throat> and this is your uh, rmac by the way i forgot to mention that that's your rmac of the model how the model is performing on test data 549.2 and mae is 407.2 what is mae by the way mae is very similar to msc we have, i know we have been talking about r squared but what is mae mae stands for mean absolute error mae stands for mean absolute error just to clarify what is mae mae is mean absolute error the formula is basically this actual minus predicted so first is error then you calculate the abs sorry i think the marker is not working sorry so first is error actual minus predicted then you calculate the absolute value of the error <clears throat> and then the mean of the absolute value i equal to 1 to n divided by n that is how we define mean absolute error so error error absolute mean very similar to uh, mse but just that it's 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 it's, it's, it's a little bit more robust it's more interpretable in a way so you can see ma ma e also that we are getting back from so one one way to interpret ma e will be it 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 tends to equally penalizes uh, both kind of differences okay? but uh, msc or msc when you take square if your error is high the penalization is much more comparatively msc when you take because you are squaring the errors right if your errors are high the penalty is actually much more the the, the overall penalty kind of expands a bit so think of it that way that the intuition behind msc versus ma e now what i want to show you all this is basic stuff you can read about it what i wanted to show you very interesting is uh, this part <clears throat> the kind of uh, the kind of metrics these guys actually use very interesting look at this in the case of a regression model in the case of a regression model we publish r squared we talked about r squared we talked about rmsc i think one thing that we have not quite talked about just now we talked about mae uber data scientists also use the same metrics they use r squared they use rmsc and they use mae okay and we have not talked about one metric which is rmsc now what i would like you guys to do is i would like you guys to maybe think think for a minute what is the possible use case of rmsl think about it what is the possible use case of rmsl what is rmsl used for in the uber data uh, uber context think about it i think i'll help you out with the formula for rmsl <clears throat> so rmsl is root mean square logarithmic error and the way to read that would be <clears throat> the way to read that would be let me just create some space this side uh, okay the question basically is why would you what what is the use case of having rmsc what is the benefit of root mean square log error okay maybe i'll write the formula for you here a quick formula i'll just write down for you here so rmsc goes like this that's your rmsc <coughs> i'm sorry i think this is not this will not stay uh, we may second guys uh, i think this one to 
just want to make uh, show that part to you i think you got you all got this part right? if you all got this part i can i can come out of here for a second i think i've already shared the links with you so let me come out of this for a second i need a bigger screen to write this part so root mean square log error <coughs> okay so rmsle So first is error, first is error, then log, then square. So same thing. First is log error, log. What is log error? Log error is log actual. So log of y actual minus log of y predicted. Straightforward. The formula might 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 seem like rocket science, but once you break it down, there are no formulas in data science. It's just logic, okay? Basic logic. Actual minus predicted. Then square it up. Then square it up. Then you take the mean of the squares. I equal to one two, and take the mean of the squares. Length the root of it. That's R M S L E. What you have to tell me is what is the context of using this in a Uber problem? Why is this important for Uber than the usual R M S C that we talked about? What is R M S C we talked about? I'm going to write down both the formulas for you. <clears throat> and you have to mathematically. This is a mathematical explanation. Okay? Slightly mathematical explanation. Actual minus predicted. So error square mean and root. Okay. So how are these two things relevant? Why is RMSA relevant for Uber? Look at the math, all of you, and think about it. Take a minute, all of you, and and think about why RMSA could be relevant for Uber. This will remove the outlier. Outlier. Uh, <clears throat> will it remove the outlier? No, not right. Not right. No. <laughs> I think when you're coming from a long discussion, no, 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 not right. Sorry, sorry, no, not right. Mm -hmm. But I think think of Uber's uh, think of Uber's very very time prediction model, or think of Uber's uh, uh, ETA model. Like when you board a Uber cab, it tells you time taken to reach is equal to uh, you know. If I tell you that it takes 20 minutes time to reach something on those lines, yeah, not 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 to the outlier, so not right, not right. Repeat. I mean, I can see that it's basically a factor of so log a minus log b basically boils down to a factor or a division between yes. predicted to actual, which uh, which would indicate that <clears throat> maybe they are using it for search phrasing. No. Okay. Just a guess. Okay. Okay. Something else? No, not uh, <laughs> something. So, else. Yeah. It's a fact. It's a factor, and then you have taken a logarithm yeah. of that factor, which means that you have scaled it. Mm -hmm. um, to the power of e. So. Let me take a simple example. I can I can take a case here. I can take a case here. So let's say Uber predicts the uh, let's say Uber predicts <clears throat> an example. Let's say Uber predicts that uh, the actual time. Let's say the actual time to for me to reach the destination. I'll give you two cases, okay? And a small hint for all of you. Uh, the actual time is equal to let's say you know a uh, uh, two minutes. And model predicted one minute. So this is a very short ride, okay? If it's a very short ride, Uber will give a prediction saying, okay, you will reach in one minute time. But actually, you reached in two minutes time. So obviously, you're very unhappy. <laughs> and I'll give you one more case. I'll give you one more case, okay? And now you're traveling from, you know, like HSR layout to Bangalore Airport. You already saw what is the state? Three hours, okay? <laughs> and very surprising. How is three hours now? Uh, anyways, uh, so let's say. One, uh, so actual time is 180 minutes, huh? <laughs> and Uber predicted, uh, you know, 179 minutes. So I've given a hint to all of you. <laughs> so what are you seeing now? 
long long distance travel it gives you the prediction for the time uh uh -huh. so what is the difference i would like to hear an answer with respect to the difference what we were doing before what we are doing now and why this is more important for uber so from that perspective based on those two examples i think you're on the right track ravin yeah so somebody else sanjay you want to go on yeah that uh, intimation comes for the next ride to pick is it similar no 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 not intimation no 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 <laughs> not intimation no 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 it's actually very simple actually just basic error math we are doing Uh, okay. Is it because the RMS rate will be uh, larger for the first case compared to the second? Yes, exactly. That's what RMS rate will be larger for the first case. Correct. The mathematics of log tells you the math of log, and it was obvious now. Huh? If you think about it from a natural uh, customer psychology point of view, you see, Uber tells you you'll reach in one minute, but you reach in two minutes. You're more unhappy actually. Because see, for shorter distances, the idea is that for shorter distances. there is less variability i must give you accurate predictions that's what it should be no i mean so it's like saying if the food is supposed to reach in 1 minute and i get in 2 minutes i am actually very unhappy and you tell me like bangalore air airport is going to take you 179 minutes uber may prediction has come <laughs> it takes you 180 minutes will you be so unhappy of course not in any way you have slept in the cab for 3 hours you will sleep for 1 minute more think of it that way i'm just giving an example but the point is <clears throat> the point is uh, you will penalize you will penalize smaller values much more the math works out in a way the math works out in a way for rmc the math works out in a way where the difference is equally penalized <clears throat> like if you look at 2 minus 1 whole square and 180 minus 179 whole square the difference is one in both right they both equally penalized <clears throat> but that is not right i don't want it to be, i don't want it to have equal penalization i want the, the the mathematics of log works in such a way that if you see if you look at the math of log that's your x and that's your uh, you know log x that's the math of log log is a distribution like this that's your log distribution and and what happens here is <clears throat> that's your 1 and that's your 2 let me just point it out here that's your 1 and that's your 2 so log 1 log 2 minus log 1 is a very high value as 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 rightly mentioned but log 180 minus log 179 is not a very high value it's a very small difference so this is 180 this is 179 and this difference why difference is not large whereas log 2 minus log 1 the difference is large this this why difference is very large this is a very high difference so I, i'm going to penalize this much more that's the way to look at it intuitively so this is again based on you know domain to domain so this is a interesting way so generally regression problems we stick to these metrics we don't go beyond these metrics this is what we look at generally so no matter what business problem we are looking at uh, generally these are the metrics that we we'll typically talk about yes sir so question this this uh, introduces the emotional component of the customer how mm -hmm. he, the feeling exactly yes 100% yes true exactly so obviously uh, in a way that's how it should be that's how it should be so if you if your values are really large the penalty should not be so much i mean anyway you know so in a way that is also incorporated in a way yes okay, okay. because i want to penalize you more in this case because maybe the customer is more dissatisfied here anyways i am incorporating that with the customer feedback also that's different but this is a incorporate it's obvious i mean it's a normal customer sentiment i mean if, if it tells you like it, it you I, i will i will drop you in 10 minutes and if it is percentage increase no guys i i know i know 1 and 2 is hard to digest but let's take 10 and 20 so on one hand i will take 10 and 20 <coughs> okay 10 and 20 is coming here 10 minutes and it the uh, right takes like 20 minutes Okay, and now Bangalore Airport, you know, 180 minutes. But model predicted 160 minutes. It's okay. I mean, one, it's okay. I mean, it's not a big deal, right? Very close to 180, no. But this is a big deal. This is a big deal. 10 minutes, 20 minutes is a big deal because you have a meeting in, uh, uh, you know, 10 minutes. You plan the ride accordingly, and you miss the meeting now. That's the problem. Okay, that's the way to look at it. Okay, great. So uh, <clears throat> let's move on. and we'll talk about some of the basic ideas of clustering as we speak now with a couple of interesting case study ideas okay but a good uh, half an hour left now take a small pause for a second here okay take a small quick 2 minutes pause here come
All right. So let's get a move on and let's talk about clustering and some of the basic ideas around clustering. Well, clustering again as a technique can be, uh, you know, thought of in we can think of in multiple ways and uh, just to just to help you understand the business aspect of doing clustering and why we why we look at clustering and <clears throat> what are the reasons we do it. So all that we are trying to do here is we are trying to understand that I tell you, this time we don't have any labels. There are no labels. There are no labels we have in our data. We only have features. We only have x1, x2, x3. So a simple way to understand clustering will be let's say think of a park. Think of a park. And you see lots of dogs in the park. Simple example I'm taking. You see lots of dogs in the park. Okay. You have dogs of this type. You have dogs of, let's say, dogs which are of green color. I'm taking a simple example. Obviously, you have green color dogs. Okay. And let's say you've got dogs of black color. So you're seeing three different types of dogs. You've got dogs like this, dogs like this, dogs like this. So you go to the park one fine day, and this is what you're observing. You know nothing about dogs. Nobody has taught you anything about dogs. Even without knowing nothing about dogs, you can just look at the features of these dogs. Features, I mean to say, the color of the dog, the size of the dog, the shape of the dog, the amount of fur they have, how they look, how aggressive they are. Even without knowing what they are called, I can still say that dogs of this are the same type, dogs of this are the same type, and dogs of this are the same type. Remember, there is no output data. I, I, I don't know what the dog is called, but all I have is I've got a lot of input data. I have X1, X2, X3, all these features. I don't have any output, but on the basis of these inputs, all I've done is I've formed three different clusters of data. This is cluster one, this is cluster two, this is cluster three, and each of these clusters tell me something about a distinct kind of dog. So this is one type of dog, this is another type of dog, this is another type of dog. What is this dog called? I don't know. <clears throat> because nobody has taught me. There's no output. So this is a very crucial difference between supervised and unsupervised learning. In supervised learning, uh, you are training a model to learn a function which maps the input to the output. It's a function approximation, y equal to some function of x. That's what you're doing in supervised learning. In unsupervised learning, there is no function. There's no x, y only. So you cannot model any function. But what you do is you try to find out the hidden patterns and you're trying to basically see, okay, what are the different types of work? What are the different clusters of data that we have? Okay, very similar to what we did in our first day, right? If you if you recall the California housing case study that we did second day, in fact, second day, part of first day also we saw that. The second day, mostly we saw that example. California housing case study, if you recall, what we found was we found two distinct districts. We found two distinct, uh, we, don't, we found two distinct clusters of data. The entire city of Cali uh, state of California we found two distinct clusters of data, one around San Francisco, one around Los Angeles, two distinct peaks of these we found actually. And hence, I, I use this term on, on the first day also, hence unsupervised learning technically we can say is a kind of uh, EDA. So whatever uh, clustering that you're talking about right now, you're looking at clusters, you're looking to identify clusters, what are the clusters of groups of data? You go to the park and you see the different types of dogs and you see, okay, these are dogs of one type, dogs of one type. Of... All you're doing is, it's not a prediction problem. It is only an exploratory data analysis problem. It's an EDA problem. It's a more advanced way of doing EDA basically. All you're saying is, okay, these are dogs of some type. And now you can decide, okay, what I want to do with these type of dogs. And that's the way to think of your, uh, you know, unsupervised learning process. A more practical way we, apply these things in real time problems. If I have to just tell you the workflow, how we do it, because one question to be the sign, if you're saying it's only EDA, then what's the use? Like how do people actually use clustering? How can we possibly, <coughs> you know, possibly use a clustering algorithm? See, all these are technicalities. I will not get into the technicalities. As I said, the math and all we'll not discuss. Again, Audacity, the course talks beautifully about uh, how k-means is done, how DB scan is done, how uh, agglomerative clustering is done. These are the different types of clustering algorithms. What I'm trying to focus on is a very high level, a broad idea of how clustering is done in organizations and projects. So one way to look at clustering is purely from a very exploratory view. You look at your data and you find out clusters. Okay, I think I can see three different clusters of data. So you give you give me a you give me a data set of customers, like what we did in our very interesting. So if you if you recall the feature engineering example I showed showed you some time back, the automated feature engineering. I gave you uh, 
you know, what I did there was <clears throat> I had three different data sets, right? Uh, I had loan data, I had customer data, I had payment data, and I merged all of them, right? Effectively, I've got customer level data. Now, using that, there's no output in that data set. There's no output. That 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 loan repaid, not repaid, is only an example I was taking. But if you look at the actual data, it's only feature engineering. There's no output column there. Okay, there's no model that we built eventually. Only features we created. Now, it's a beautiful use case of clustering. You know how? You can go back and now try to do clusters of customers now. Now you've got all these features of customers. Okay, this is customer ID one, client ID one, and that client ID. Uh, when was the last date you took a loan? How much total loan amount? What is the skew of loan rate? All of those features you've got. All 800 features you've got. And now each row is a customer, and I can find out groups or clusters of customers now. What are the different types of customers? Can I say what a customer is? Is a customer good, bad? I don't know. Nobody has trained me. There's no output data. But what I can say is, I can say that okay, these are a, these are a similar types of customers. These are customers of one type. These are customers of another type, and these are customers of another type. And that's how we can basically uh, do what we call customer segmentation. It's called custom. <coughs> sorry. <coughs> sorry. It's called customer segmentation. So what is customer segmentation? It's creating groups or clusters of customers. So first, so ultimately, again, clustering problem is not a very hard problem. Again, there are algorithms like K means is one line of code. I'll show the code to you in a second. Okay. Algorithm is very simple. There's nothing in the algorithm, but you will put a lot of effort in doing the feature engineering. <clears throat> so to identify, I'll, I'll tell you what to identify uh, different types of dogs in this particular, uh, you know, uh, park example. You got to have good quality features. You got to have good quality features. See, I cannot, like, for example, I cannot just have a fur feature. No, just an example, okay? <laughs> I know it looks funny, okay? But I, I just cannot have one feature called fur and say, okay, fur is present, fur is present, fur is present, fur is present. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, let's say you're looking at five, seven different types of dogs. And you only have information about fur. What clustering can you do? It's obvious no all dogs are furs, right? You tell me one dog that doesn't have fur. I mean, see, fur and fur, and we can debate about what is fur, but the point is, you, you, you have such a skin, right? All dogs will have some basic attributes, right? Now you're saying, okay, eye is there. So you say, the dog has eyes. Obviously, eye will be there, no? So does the dog have eye? Yes, 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 yes. These are the two features we have got. Can you do clustering on this? Of course not. What clustering will you do? <laughs> that was the same kind of dog only. Now to do clustering effectively, feature engineering. <clears throat> feature engineering, you have to create better quality features. Now you start adding better quality features. Now you start saying, okay, aggressiveness. Maybe you've got uh, these, you know, bulldogs, bulldogs, and maybe you've got these, uh, uh, I don't know, these, these German shepherds, okay, Alsatians, okay. Not, okay, these are these uh, very cute little dogs, no? Small, small dogs you've got. Okay. And these are the, now you've got some something very powerful. And now you've got something more powerful, the size. So typically this is aggressive dog, very big, large in size, large in size, large in size. And now you've got something very powerful, small in size, small in size, large in size, small in size. And now you can say that, hey, from all these features, I can say that I've identified two distinct clusters of dogs. So one cluster of dogs based on all the features. These are worthless features, by the way, you can drop these features. Again, the ideas of feature engineering that we talked about remain the same in clustering, there's no difference. The good quality data, garbage in, garbage out. So feature extraction, create better quality features and feature selection, uh, you know, kind of remove the worthless features, only use the important features. Now, what are the distinct clusters of dogs you found out? Okay, I, I, can, I can see this is one distinct cluster. This is one type of dog. This is one distinct cluster I found. I'll take a green color here, okay? So, okay, what's that? Give me a second. Uh, not able to select the color. Okay, I'm not sure. Give me a second, guys. Huh. This is one distinct color, <clears throat> one distinct uh, cluster of dogs, and this is one more distinct cluster. This is a this is one distinct cluster, and the other distinct cluster. So two distinct clusters of dogs. One is the green cluster, and the other is the blue cluster. The green cluster corresponds to the aggressive cluster, and the blue cluster is the not so aggressive cluster. This is the blue cluster, the green cluster. So we've got two distinct clusters of dogs. One aggressive, one not not aggressive. And that's the way to actually go go ahead and look at uh, how you how you do the whole thing how you understand these aspects, okay? So clustering at its, at its core is again feature engineering. So create better, better quality features and then identify what the distinct clusters of data are. And very, very important, this is a very important idea, okay? Remember the level of detail of your data. So what is the level of detail of your data? Very important. So one aspect where I find a lot of people struggling, right? Whenever you're getting data from your source system, understand the level of detail of your data. 
So if you're doing customer, if you're trying to create clusters or groups of customers, if you're trying to do customer segmentation in the line of your business or in the line of Walmart business or in the line of any retail business or the line of any telecom business, customer level data has to be important. So transactional data that you collect from your system might not be there. So data from the transactional system might be in any format. And now you have to do a group by customer ID you have to convert it to a customer ID level of detail, exactly what we did in the uh, feature engineering problem. So for every customer, what is the average loan rate? What is the total uh, loan amount? What is the average payment? So every customer, I'm collecting features of the customer. And now I can do segmentation of customers, groups of customers I can create. And the algorithms are very different ideas. That, that is very different, that's the math around it. But it's the idea behind it, how you transform your data first, right? If you're trying to do, uh, let's say clustering of uh, movies, can you do clustering of movies? Yes, you can. You can go to IMDB, you can take a list of all the movies, movie one, movie two, movie three, movie four. Every movie will have a characteristic. What is the total runtime box office rating and all that? And on the basis of that, hey, these are movies of some one type, movies of another type, movies of another type. Are you trying to are you trying to classify a movie as good, bad or something? No, I'm not. It's not a sentiment analysis model. Can you do that? Yes, you can, if you have labeled data for it. But we are just looking at clustering. What are the different groups of movies? Can you do clustering of items? Yes, you can. You can cluster items together. Something that Amazon is already doing, right? So, you, so one way to do it is you can probably uh, manually label a particular item belonging to a particular category, electronics category, mobile category. But hey, looking at the looking at the features of an item, can I uh, cluster the items into similar buckets? Yes, I can. A clustering of products, similar groups of products. Google is doing clustering in a big way. So, what are the kind of clustering Google is doing? Google News, excellent example of clustering. Google News, let me take you there. So, look at Google News, all of you. <clears throat> Google News, look at this. So, Google Pixel 5. Okay, sorry, I think I <laughs> I searched with Google, so obviously, so <laughs> the first term will obviously come first, right? Let me just uh, have a generic uh, thing. News.google.com, straight forward. Sushant Singh Rajput, something came up on him. So we can read about it later, whatever it is. So you can see right now, all these news stories are grouped under the same header. All these news stories are grouped under the same header. China reacts, PUBG is banned, good for the country, I guess. Everybody, you know, it's a waste of time in a way, PUBG. <laughs> PUBG got banned today, okay. Anyways, uh, so all these, all these news stories are grouped together. Why? You know, on the basis of what? Now you understand uh, a little bit of textual data. Now you guys know how to convert a news story to numbers. That that entire article that you're talking about is nothing but numbers. You can convert that to a document or matrix. So one row, each row is basically one article now. It's document or matrix. In, it's, all, it's all about features. Ultimately, it's all about features. You, each row is a document. Each, that is here is article, one news story. And now you've got features of that article. So what kind of words it contains? If two articles contain similar kinds of words, they're very similar. Now these are articles at the same time. Articles at the same time. Beautiful use case of clustering that Google is doing in day-to-day -day scenarios. <clears throat> okay. But in a more practical scenario, if you look at it, Google is kind of doing, and you can see it will also tell you like similar stories, you know, show similar searches. Oftentimes, if you look at Feedly, all these RSS feeds and all that. Okay, RSS means I'm talking about the other RSS, but it's not this one. <laughs> So the RSS feeds and all, if you see, it will often say that, it will often say that, okay, so do you want to see similar stories? Let's say if you're browsing something on technology and Google asks you, okay, do you want to see something more on technology? I can click on technology, okay? And it tells me, okay, you want to read something more about this, something more about this, okay, something more about these topics. So this will often prompt you, okay? All right, anyway, so this is one use case of uh, clustering. The other very prominent use case of clustering lies in <coughs> the semi-supervised side of things. What is semi-supervised? I'm going to take a quick minute to talk about that. Very, very interesting use case and something that comes up quite a lot generally. So what is a semi-supervised learning use case? Let's see. Generally, whatever models we have built until now, generally all the models we have built until now, I want to talk about a simple example, right? I want to go back to the housing example that we did sometime back, if you recall. So what we did was we took the whole data and the data was like what? The data was come out like this. Let's say we have a size of the house and we have price of the house. I'm going to take a simple example to understand the ideas for you. Okay, so this is the size of the house, this is the price of the house, and what we have is something like this. We're seeing a pattern that looks somewhat like this. And let's say it's an exponential logarithmic pattern from here onwards. 
see what we have done until now is we have kind of i don't know let's say there is some kind of uh downturn happening in this segment very interesting actually the pattern here is very interesting but anyways uh, this is what you see what we have done until now is we have we have used a single algorithm to try to model the data in the in, in so try to build a single model on the whole data that's what we have tried to do it could be either a regression model or a more complex non linear model whatever we are we are trying to do to so try to build a single model on the whole data that's what we have tried to do we had a we had this data set right now and what we have tried to do is we have tried to build a single model on the whole data set that's pretty much what we have intended uh, try to do in this in this whole exercise now what we are proposing is now we are saying let's make the process more robust something that is practically done in many organizations almost all organizations which are, which are having ml projects at a scale <clears throat> so what practically organizations will do is now they will first do unsupervised learning clustering they will first do ul ul is unsupervised learning clustering so they will say okay let me not build a single supervised learning model on the whole data let me not do that let me not build a single supervised learning model on the whole data rather than that let me go back and let me instead of building a single supervised learning model on the whole data <coughs> let me first do clustering and let me identify the different clusters of data here what are the three different clusters i'll find right now let me identify the clusters here let's put down the green points here these are the three distinct clusters you will end up getting this is all size versus uh, price by the way guys so there goes cluster 1 for small houses medium uh, small uh, low budget houses this is cluster 2 you're seeing a very interesting pattern for cluster 2 the mid budget segment is showing a very interesting pattern okay it's more almost like a parabolic pattern you are seeing for cluster 2 mid budget and cluster 3 is almost like the exponential logarithmic curve is there which is expected like as houses get very very uh, bigger uh, the prices will have to kind of become stagnant at some point right this is what you are observing right now and now what we do is now we can actually build better models so first we divide our data into clusters cluster 0 cluster 1 and cluster 2 remember each row is a house so we are doing clustering of houses and now for each type of house we will end up building a different supervised learning model it could be a linear regression here it could be a polynomial regression here and it could be a gradient boosting regression here and now three different supervised learning models on uh, three different clusters of data and this is the more uh, practical way to go about the whole thing and in production we will maintain three different models so you have model n uh, model 1 model 2 and model 3 so we are not building a single model in production we will actually have three different models and in production you will actually maintain three different models in production so in product so this is the training process right so in production when new data comes people might ask you sir what happens in production in production when new data comes when new data comes <coughs> what will happen is you will first use your clustering algorithm to predict which cluster it belongs to so new data matlab size new house what is the size of the house tell me the feature what is the size of the house new data is coming on the basis of that you try to predict what cluster it belongs to which cluster once you find out which cluster you say okay if cluster 0 lr dot predict else if cluster 1 pr dot predict else if cluster 2 gbr dot predict that's how we will do it so depending on which cluster you are in you will do the respective three predictions and it's not uncommon to have hundreds of such supervised learning models parallelly coexisting in production hundreds of models can parallelly coexist in production amazon will not have a single recommendation system model amazon will have several recommendation system models for different locations if you're in india if you're in us if you're in some other uh, part of the country you will have different uh, recommendation system models and further their recommendation system models can be different for different uh, parts of the country tier 2 cities tier 1 cities tier 3 cities the patterns are very different if the patterns are very different you don't want a single model to represent all the patterns because what happens guys if i use a single model to represent all the patterns like can i not do it i mean you can argue that fine you have learned so much of ml can we not do that can we not draw a single model that represents all these patterns yes you can do it but the problem is overfitting there's so much of variation here if you try to incorporate a single model to represent all these patterns no you will actually end up getting overfit models so they will work very well in training but they will not generalize well in production <clears throat> the patterns are so varied you can see look at the look at the medium housing segment it's such a varied pattern it's very hard for the model to learn i'm making it easy for the model to learn and generalize 
let me cluster it out and let me learn it separately on the image this is what we call semi supervised learning okay unsupervised plus supervised is semi supervised this is unsupervised part this is semi this is supervised part and in a way we can call it a semi supervised learning workflow this is a very common kind of thing you will do in production so if i could relate it to customer segmentation and a very common kind of use case the telecom companies are using nowadays a very common use case is <coughs> they are using churn churn analysis right churn prediction that like how do you predict whether a particular like same use case that we are discussing attrition prediction how how do you predict whether a particular customer is going to leave my service or is going to kind of uh, move on to a different service provider how do you predict that churn prediction right so you will not build a single churn prediction model on the whole data because there are so many variations customers will have so many you know there's there's so many possible variations that the customer will have that you will not build a single churn prediction model on the whole data that becomes very complex very very difficult process actually to maintain so i will not build a single churn prediction model on the whole data rather what i will do is i will first do unsupervised learning do a clustering workflow break your data into different different clusters find out the different groups of customers customer group 1 customer group 2 customer group 3 each group of customers will tell a different story about the customer maybe group 1 customers correspond to people who uh, just to take an example <coughs> let's say uh, you know let's say group 1 customers are people let's say we talk about alliance geo so geo has a lot of money with it right now and they'll be doing a lot of this data science but they are already doing it in the at the forefront of uh, data science that they are doing right now a lot of amazing work they are doing right now in this field uh, so let's say you know let's say i would say uh, they are doing a customer churn prediction model and one of the first steps they would have taken is they would have they would have done some clustering and they have identified that hey like uh, i broken my entire customer data okay let me not use any names here <laughs> see just just an example i'm taking okay anyways so this is data and uh, let's say i've done unsupervised learning or clustering on the whole data <clears throat> and you have identified that you have identified that there are two distinct groups of customers customers of group 0 customers of group 1 group 0 customers are high international roamers high international roaming let's say so these are customers who tend to travel international quite frequently as an example okay so these are customers who tend to travel international quite frequently high international roamers and group 1 customers are customers who are let's say normal customers again it's a very simplistic clustering i'm doing okay so now what you will do is for each of the different buckets you will fit a different churn prediction model churn prediction model is a supervised uh, classification model so now for international roamers a separate uh, uh, you know a, a separate let's say gradient boosting classifier for this and for normal customers a separate gradient boosting classifier for this to predict whether the customer will churn or not yes no kind of problem that we have and why is it important to discuss this because remember geo may international roaming is actually very bad okay so if you if you've ever travel to countries like malaysia singapore and any, any country for that matter if you are having reliance geo international roaming is not that good recently i have not traveled i'm not sure about the service right now uh, i think they probably would have invested but at least even i would say i was i was i was abroad just last year december i was out so it it was it was not that good so you know vodafone and airtel have great service uh, you know international but jio doesn't have it so the reason it's important to talk about this is because if you are like if i have looked at your uh, data patterns if i've seen that generally <clears throat> whatever patterns i'm seeing it 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 shows that you are i mean you are more of an international roamer you you tend to travel international more frequently then the probability of you churning is generally very high because the people typically who travel international they don't like the geo service they would like probably they would like to switch maybe maybe i would like to switch maybe most likely will probably going to churn something of that sort and maybe the patterns will be very not only churn prediction they are doing several types of things there okay for the geo app you are trying to do a lot of things so it's the entire ecosystem we are talking about now now if i know that you are you are a very frequent international roamer maybe i'll tie you up with other kinds of services <clears throat> something else maybe i'll try to give you some Uh, uh, because I know you all will be you, because I know the probability of churn is very high. So maybe to retain you, I'll probably give you some geo fiber service free, something of that. Anyways, it's free only nowadays. Okay, so it's very very cheap. They reduce the plans actually. So and not cheap from that perspective. I think there's nothing else in the country as good as this. So uh, but but obviously it's very very inexpensive plans that they put. So maybe uh, that there are very two different groups that I'm seeing, and there are very two different models that I will actually want to learn. For normal customers, obviously it's a very different churn prediction model. 
So if you try to fit all of it in a single classification uh, model, what will happen is the patterns are so varied, the patterns are so diverse, that that model itself will become very overfit. That's the problem. So which is why practical workflows, you will always want to segregate into clusters and then you won't want to do it. That's one of the ways to actually approach it. <clears throat> Clustering also can happen through many, many ways, just like we have seen uh, supervised learning workflows can happen through many different means. Clustering itself can happen through many different means. The, the one obvious uh, kind of clustering that you have is the K-means clustering. It's the most basic kind of clustering that we have. Uh, what a wonderful demo plan for this, which I'll just show you. I will not get to the math, guys. The math is something I've given some reading material to read from. So please study from, please do study from this. It's important to read those aspects. I'm not trying to discount the maths, but that's not what we intend to do here. That's why I'm not getting into that aspect. But there are several different clustering methods available. Just like we did the walkthrough of the, you know, the, the classification models. And this is, the, this is a small idea of, of what you have in the world of clustering. There are several different ways to cluster data. And remember, uh, <clears throat> it's not just about a single, it's not just about a single model that you will use. It's, it, it, it's the wisdom of the crowd here also. It's the wisdom of the crowd here also. It's completely unsupervised. You will not know that one technique is giving you the right results or not. So you'll want to go back, try out multiple techniques, uh, learn from multiple techniques and, and use an ensemble in, in some capacity. So here also, uh, read about it. I would say, uh, if, if this sounds too overwhelming, the most important clustering techniques we generally talk about and which the Udacity code touches upon also, very nicely they explain those things in a slightly mathematical way, is mini batch k-means, mini batch k-means, and we're talking about db scan, and we are talking about agglomerative clustering. These are the three techniques that generally uh, gets talked about and used in practice. So I would say read about these three techniques. At least it will get you introduced to the world of clustering, how you do it. Right? So again, you can see there's no label here in case you're wondering, Sai, what about the colors? How have you colored your data? <clears throat> we have colored our data purely based on cluster numbers. We have colored our data purely based on cluster numbers, not based on labels. There's no output that we have right now. So purely based on cluster numbers, we have just uh, colored our data. Okay, so that's the way to kind of look at it, how it's happening. And just to show you visually, I think it's just fun to learn these concepts visually. And you might not see these references used in uh, some of these books and articles that you will refer. So I still want to ping you these references so that you can read about it more. Uh, these are two very popular clustering techniques and I found these visualizations very helpful, very effective in the learning process. So as you're reading about these topics in detail, I will encourage you to kind of uh, refer to these visualizations. For example, uh, you're seeing that there are total four clusters and this is how the K-means algorithm kind of is working. That's the math behind K-means, how it's happening, but you know, after it, after it does the entire thing, it will iterate, there are several of these iterations it will do. And there's a, there's a certain algorithm that is actually working on the basis of which K-means is happening. And Finally, the clusters that I will basically get will look somewhat like this. That's how the clusters will kind of converge right now. You see four beautiful clusters coming out right now for me. And that's the key means we are doing it. And, the, and, and, and one of the things to remember, is, is this is one quick takeaway for all of you from this whole thing. Key means will typically build spherical clusters for you. So key means is a very simplistic technique generally. It's a very simplistic technique. It will typically build spherical clusters for you. And we have one more thing called DB scan. DB scan stands for density based clustering. It's a slightly more uh, advanced clustering technique. And DB scan will build the wonderful clusters for you. For example, I have something called a pimple smiley. You want to see how a pimple smiley looks like, let's say. Very interesting. I can show you this example here. So uh, I think it's just fun to try it out. Okay. So you can click on go and you can see how amazingly the clusters actually get built here. It's not, it's not like a spherical approach. It's kind of a very, uh, uh, you know, density based approach. Density based approach means you're, uh, you're trying to find out like what are the high density points and you try to gobble it up. Think of it like think of it like you try to go, think of it like the Pac-Man game. No? You try to try to gobble up the dots in front of you. <laughs> it's, it's almost like that. And it's just a very very powerful way of doing clustering. One one great one great thing about DB scan uh, is that uh, the outliers are very well handled here. So in K-means even the outliers will be part of your clusters, but in DB scan the outliers are executed in a way. So you can see how beautifully it kind of understands that the mouth is somewhat separate and it's not nearby and it kind of understands this beautifully. Look at the outliers, the noise points, they're called noise points dot, 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 dot. That's what we call the noise points. And the noise points are excluded from clustering. So how beautifully the model understands what to do. So it's not about one technique and not the other technique, but it's more about 
uh, using a combination of all these uh, different techniques. That's how we practically go about this whole thing. Okay. Okay, questions, guys. <laughs> we got a long session here. <laughs> Just to show you the application, the code is not so hard. Uh, I, I will encourage you to read about it later on, but the code is not so hard. I wanted to show you briefly what it is, but let's say this is my V1 and V2 features we have got. Okay, uh, there's no output data you've got right now. Just two features, V1 and V2 we have got. And <clears throat> all that we are trying to do is, uh, we are trying to uh, kind of do the clustering and we are trying to uh, kind of figure out what groups they belong to. There a couple of steps involved in the clustering process and we are eventually trying to figure out that hey, what 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 steps they belong to? The broad workflow in SK learn is the same. The same K means you initialize, you define how many clusters you want to create, uh, dot fit, dot predict. So that SK learn API is very very similar across the board. Okay, and as the cluster numbers, how many clusters? Three clusters, zero, one, and two. And this is just a visualization of the clusters. Cluster zero, cluster one, cluster two. So what you're seeing right now here is just a visualization of those clusters. How those clusters kind of look like in a way. Okay. So spherical clusters is work very nice, but as I said, non-spherical clusters, DB scan, you will face a lot of challenges generally. Yes. Ah, sorry, uh, K means you will face challenges generally. Yes. Yes. So uh, Shalja, uh, in case of unsupervised learning, since we don't know the output value, how can we find out if the data or also algo is a good fit? Well, uh, you know, uh, exactly. Can we only predict clusters in this type of data? That's a good question, Shelda. So Shelda's question that to read out for all of you is, she's saying unsupervised learning or clustering, if we build a clustering model, for example, you know, let's say I build this kind of a model, how do I possibly know that it's a, you know, this, this kind of a model is, is a good fit or not? Well, I think if you've read a little bit about this topic, generally all the books and articles will talk about something called inertia, SSE and all that stuff. But generally, this is something that is there, but generally what we do in practice, I'm talking about in practice in projects what you will typically do is you will keep a certain amount of semi labeled data aside you will keep some data aside and you will try to calculate the accuracy on the basis of that otherwise by itself because there is no output you cannot directly uh, <clears throat> you cannot directly go back and i would say you cannot directly say okay you know what is the accuracy precision recalls you cannot directly say let's say you built a customer segmentation model okay zero customer zero customer one customer two let's say you built a uh, kind of a segment clustering model like this now you cannot say for sure like whether the clustering has happened properly or not there are metrics you can use obviously that and all you've got but generally one of the more popular approaches we use is we we keep aside some part of this data as semi labeled data so we, we 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 use domain experts help and we keep some part of this data for semi for, for semi level data so for example we'll keep some part of this data aside and we say okay this is let's say this is all green we'll keep some part of this data aside and we'll say this is red and we'll keep some part of this data aside and we'll call it blue that's that's like our test set that's like our test set so once we build the clustering model we will let the model predict okay what these actuals are what these predicted are actuals i know this is labeled by the domain experts and now I'll compare. Okay, so uh, actual by domain experts say they are part of cluster zero. Uh, my clustering model says they are part of cluster zero. So I think correct classification. So that so you can you can actually in a way think of a clustering problem as a uh, I would say the classification problem. And now we can calculate precision, recalls, F1 scores, accuracy the same way uh, through this uh, approach. Did you understand what I said? Does it make sense? Yeah. This is yes, one of the ways we can actually yeah. Okay. So, so like a semi level way of doing it. Yes. So we use this label data as, as a part of validation or a test. Yes, yes, yes. Part of, as a part of validation. Remember, domain expert is, is a very important part of clustering. You will always have some room for error. You will always have some room, but you have to sit with your domain expert, especially if I'm talking about customer segmentation models. Like in the mm -hmm. context of finance, the models will be very different. In the context of retail, very different. Retail, there are so many different types of metrics you might have. Okay, so again, the domain expert will sit and the domain expert will say, okay, customers in this group, typically have these, 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 these attributes. So on the basis of that, now you do your clustering and you evaluate, okay, this is what my domain expert says, and this is what my model says, and are we in agreement? And if so, how much accurate are we? So that's the way to evaluate in a way. So you keep some test set aside for clustering. Yes. Otherwise there is no way to evaluate, there's no training. In clustering, there's no training and tested aspects. There's no train test that you do. In this entire process, if you see, there's no train test here. 
the only testing data is basically that domain expert data that you create. Sam, can and, you and, and, yeah, yeah. brief about the other libraries like TensorFlow, PyTorch, and uh... so I would say you know PyTorch is I, I would say generally speaking TensorFlow yes. obviously was released by Google as you know, but no on, on, today today's world TensorFlow in 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 general doesn't get doesn't get used a lot. Uh, there are high level wrappers around TensorFlow called Keras that we that we have now, and very interesting the TensorFlow project if you see uh, there's a very interesting story around it. So when TensorFlow was released. Uh, Obviously, it was popular and deep learning one of the one of the biggest frameworks that time. So back that time, there was nothing else actually. We had very other projects were not that that good. So anyway, uh, so this was the thing. TensorFlow was hard. You have to write a lot of code, and uh, the developers didn't like it too much. And even though developers were able to do it, but I mean the, I mean you are not able to you are not able to really take it beyond that developer community. So that's why Keras came in, and there was a person named uh, Francis Shole. So uh, Francis Shole. Let me just quickly bring you that link. So there's a person named Francis Shole. See if I'm pronouncing the name correctly. Francis Shole. <laughs> there it goes. So he he invented Keras. Keras actually. So he came in and he thought about it. He said that hey, like uh, TensorFlow is so hard. <laughs> so why not I build a wrapper on top of it? So Keras is basically not a library. Just to clarify, Keras is only a wrapper. So all that Keras does it. It takes other deep learning libraries like TensorFlow. Uh, you know, you've got uh, you know Tiano, uh, 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 okay. So CNTK, CNTK by Microsoft. So you take other other deep learning libraries, and Keras basically builds the wrapper. So Keras Francis Shole says that hey, you don't have to write, you don't have to learn each of these libraries separately. You now, don't have to learn this, learn this, learn this separately. You learn Keras. Keras is two lines of code. Just learn this, and inside Keras, I've done all the implementation. So you just learn Keras. Keras the two lines of code you write, and Keras two lines of code will convert it to 50 lines of code in TensorFlow. So Keras became hugely popular. Even today, Keras is very, very popular today. If you look at it, Keras is very, very popular, and it's used left, right, center. So, and you see, see, it's like saying if you want to, like, I mean, it's like if you want to, you know, drive a car, will you, will you start from the tire and build the car? Of course not. I mean, if I have it, I'll use it. I'll just buy it from somebody. Right? So Keras is hugely popular. But the only problem around Keras is maybe I would say <clears throat> uh, the low-level functionality. If you want to customize and tweak. Uh, it's not so robust i would say in a way the low level details the low level implementation you can't get to in a way uh, so which is why another framework that is very very popular that gets used is pytorch so pytorch is kind of i would say the best of both worlds so pytorch gives you the the high level ideas around keras like the way keras does it so pytorch is also pretty nice and uh, pytorch also allows you to you know like write the base code so you can Pretty much like that. That kind of layer also is there. So just to clarify, today there is nothing called TensorFlow separate, Keras separate. So today TensorFlow is Keras is one thing because what happened was you know Google is also smart, no? They hired him actually. <laughs> so Francis Shole he later went on to join Google and he actually like and and today there is nothing called. See if you are if you are doing this deep learning thing, maybe even few years back you will import TensorFlow separately, Keras separately. We used to call it TensorFlow, Keras. but today there is TensorFlow Keras. Actually, there is nothing called TensorFlow and Keras separate. Today is basically called TensorFlow Keras. So TensorFlow, so it, it's like saying you know, it's, it's part of the same code base. So now the module that you use is basically TF Keras. So it, 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 it's the same thing. The idea is the same. Okay. So now your Keras is uh, the, the code base is the same. Basically. Okay. So this is this is in comparison with SQLN, right? Uh, so it is a kind of a complex. Exactly. So what you have, so it's like saying in classical machine learning, whatever we have studied in SQLN, open source uh, in SQLN. So in in deep learning, that will be Keras in a way. So yeah. <laughs> so what you have in SQLN in 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 classical ML, you have in Keras in 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 deep learning. Keras is also very simple actually, and I would say that book I recommended to you on the first day, Hands On Machine Learning with Scikit-Learn Tensor. It's a very good book, very good book, and. Uh, 60% of the book talks about machine learning. The remaining 40% of the book talks about deep learning. Deep learning is introduced in a nice way, and they, and they, and and see the ideas are not very different now. Now that you have studied the concepts of <clears throat> ML, you understand the basic ideas of regression, classification. You understand the flow. Deep learning is nothing different. Same thing you are doing there also. The only difference is you are using something called neural nets. Well, neural nets can be very hard. Okay, <laughs> to learn neural nets is hard. I agree. But Keras says, okay, one line of code you can implement in neural nets, right? In fact, you know, I I I shared this a few days back in my post actually. <laughs> I wanted to just quickly show you where Keras is headed today, right? <laughs> just to show you where the 
you know, where Keras is headed probably. So this, this one actually is, let me see if I can find this one. Uh, I'll probably quickly share with you guys. <clears throat> This is what we had actually, okay. So if you look at the code right now, what we are doing is we are building a Keras model and this is GPT-3, okay. GPT-3 is an open AI language model what we have. That's something else actually. Sandbox environment is created. As you can see, like you can write code, okay. So what is the code we are writing? Build a model to classify images into five groups. It's a classification model. Uh, a data set has 25,000 images, training data. Input share 5, 500 cross 500. That means 500 cross 500 pixels, okay. So input is this much, output is this much, and, and, and Keras will automatically create magic for you. Look at this. There's no code to write. Get, see, Keras code anyways is very simple, okay. And now we are saying you don't have to write that code also, okay. Let's just show you what Keras code looks like. This is very, very straightforward. That's your deep learning code. Yes, there are a few layers here, like activation, ReLU, all those things are there, but ideas are very simple, okay. So it's like, you know, you import the stuff, and then you con 2 ds convolution neural network, add a CNN layer, add a match pooling layer, and, you know, like, it's kind of uh, tem yeah. templatize the yeah i mean this is incredible this let's create you can see like <laughs> you wrote english sentence and it created the whole model in keras but uh, yeah so the same thing in, in in tensorflow would have taken you like 100 lines of code but in keras the same thing is like hardly 10 lines of code yes it's not very hard you can see the same thing is repeating model dot add model dot add model dot add it's like the this is this is how keras kind of modelizes the whole thing it's very simple very easy to learn actually very simple idea so maybe we are looking at a future where we'll not have any jobs anymore. <laughs> the kind of work you are doing, you write, uh, you know, like you saw, right? <laughs> this kind of thing, right? You, you write it in text, okay, I want to do this, okay, work is done. <laughs> so maybe automation is the next big thing happening. And it's, it's a reality, actually, a lot of this work is happening now. Yeah, and and okay. also AWS already like cloud providers already provide some uh, pre-built models, right? Uh, yeah, no, that is different. That is different. That is the pre-built models that that even AWS SageMaker. I think uh, you guys, if you use AWS SageMaker or if you're using Azure ML Studio or if you're using uh, Alteryx, if you're using uh, all the major cloud vendors, IBM Watson Studio, <clears throat> all the major cloud vendors will have uh, GUI-based machine learning, you know, platforms. All these machine learning platforms will have drag and drop things. So all this while, you know, we have seen the ideas, the code implementations, but you have got drag and drop GUI based uh, things up there. See, anyways, we are not saying SQLearn is not hard. SQLearn is not, you know, SQLearn is not hard. They're, they're also random forest classifier. Something is happening. I don't care what's happening. I'm just using it. But now we are taking it to the next level. Now we are saying, okay, random forest is there. Don't have to write code. Just drag and drop it. So build a workflow. And just to, just to clarify what we are, what I'm saying, <clears throat> your Azure Machine Learning Studio, the Azure Machine Learning Studio, and I like Azure because of the UI, for obvious reasons, I, I think I'm more biased in favor of Microsoft <laughs> because I like their UI quite a bit. I like the UI quite a bit, the way they've designed it and the way they're investing on it. So that's a little, uh, little, little awesome, okay, the way they're doing it. A lot of other vendors also, but I think they're doing, it, they're doing a good job generally. They can see uh, the UI is very nice, uh, just beautiful the way they are, the way they have set it up. You can see reader, you're reading your data, splitting your data, uh, train test split. Okay, so it's just incredible like how the thing is happening. The boosting model here, another support vector machines here, model scoring happening here, model evaluation happening here. So just a just a drag and drop. Like <laughs> there's nothing to do actually beyond the point. Now the now the important thing is basically the concepts. A domain knowledge, basically. How do you look at all these factors? But yes, obviously you can't say that you don't need to know anything, but like it's just getting easier and easier by every passing day in a way. Yes. And there are many such platforms. Almost every, uh, even a lot of statistical software that we had, uh, now had these components in, in cross <clears throat> hmm. <laughs> Try it out. I would encourage all of you to, you know, build some POCs, uh, probably like, Give it a read. The next steps would be to a just recap some of the stuff we have discussed. Uh, you have the recordings will be up in some time. Go through some of my notes. 
the Google Drive link is there. It will be active. Uh, so, so no need to rush through it. It will be there for you. Uh, but anyways, take a dump at the end of the night, uh, tonight, by the end of night or the end of the day, just take a dump. And second step would be to go to Udacity, take some of the courses, look at the theory around it, the math behind the algorithms. And I would say the next step would be to, to look at the book, the hands-on machine learning book. I think that will set you for a very good intermediate level understanding of machine learning. Uh, intermediate to advanced level, I would say, if you can study the book effectively. And from there, I would say, uh, don't waste time on any other courses or stuff. Straight away, get to problems and try to solve them. I think that should be the roadmap of how we should follow now. Yeah. Is there any uh, uh, library of uh, charts or graphs uh, like with problem statement given? Uh, we can refer like to understand how this was solved and how actually the solution looks like? Or the um, how actually the solution looks like? I'm not understanding. Can you just repeat what? No, so earlier uh, with all the exercises, we built graphs, right? Uh, with each huh. type of problem. Huh. Is there any huh. uh, kind of library of such problems listed and we can go through? Like Kaggle already provide the notebooks available, right? Uh, open notebooks. Yes, 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 yes. But no, that is different. But I'm not understanding. You're saying no, that is different. What you're saying is an open source repository of notebooks. So are you asking me for exercises, solved problems, data set? Yeah, are yeah. you asking me for some kind of reference kind of thing where you type something and you get the answer? <laughs> if you're asking me for that, there is none of that like available. Sorry, I think I missed your question. Uh, so if you're asking me for a repository, uh, <laughs> because if we had that thing, then the entire learning will be worthless. So. <laughs> Then you can just type and you will get the answer. Uh, but hopefully we're building something there. But hey, like Kaggle is the biggest right now. I would say if you're asking me for something similar to that, there is something called driven data. <clears throat> driven data. So drivendata.org is again a very, very good site for competitions. Uh, but but you know, like again, like nothing is bigger than Kaggle today. So Kaggle is the biggest today. Yeah. Driven data is, I would say, the nearest. Uh, this is also nice because they host some good competitions also here. Uh, so yes, yeah, driven data is also something I like quite a bit because of their data sets and stuff. <clears throat> but Kaggle is the biggest. I mean, you know, like 60,000 data sets there. So I don't think you will, <laughs> there's a lot to practice in Kaggle actually. Yes. And, and the best part is that, uh, the best part is that in Kaggle you get a lot of these open source notebooks. And as you rightly like you said, you can see the solutions, you can, you can learn from other people. And I would say that's, that you don't even have to go through the other things. I would say straight away, if you have followed the sessions effectively over the last four days, I would say, even right now, you can go and start working on some of the ML data. So don't get into deep learning because that's a different thing. Uh, Keras, you will probably not follow right now, but ML, classical ML, I would say, uh, maybe go to Kaggle, type machine learning and see some of the top notebooks that come up and try to go through those aspects. Try to just look at the data set. That's an excellent way to, I would say, learn. Again, it's a top-down approach. Don't try to, I would say, don't get to the math part of it right away. Look at it at a later time. Try to try to build solutions first. Like try to at least get a good hands-on flow of it. Then you start feeling more comfortable, confident. And now you want to, like you say, explore deeper into it. That would be a good way to approach it. Okay. So that, this hands-on are good actually, which we covered in four days. I think I'm pretty confident now. Yes. Yeah, so I think, so I would say, so some of that, I, I also, that's why I wanted to, you know, mention the hands-on ML book also. <laughs> So I would say that's an excellent thing. One of those case studies we also covered from there. I think I think it should get you going. Now, now I, I'm very confident when you see that book. Now, the first fifty percent of your book is going to be a breeze. It's going to be a breeze, actually. <laughs> this should be very simple. Yeah. So the next sixty percent will be a little hard. That will be like on, you know, deep learning. But yeah, the first fifty percent will be a breeze. You can see some of those concepts are there, very similar to what we talked about. Yes. Now the math is something you did not cover there also. That's a hands-on book. It's like a cookbook. So the math is not covered. Another, another good uh, you know, resource I will probably share with you. Uh, there's this person called Chris Alban. He also has a wonderful book. So I have to share one other resource with you, uh, Chris Alban. <coughs> so Chris Alban also has a wonderful book, actually, Chris Alban. So he has a blog as well, very nice blog, where he posts about uh, some of these topics. Very nice. It's, it's almost like a cookbook. No theory, uh, just, just, just a cookbook kind of thing. So let's say uh, you, can, you can read about it. Very nice. So he has a book on O'Reilly. You guys will have O'Reilly access as well. So you can straight away probably look up, uh, let me see the name of this book, Machine Learning Cookbook. So Machine Learning with Python Cookbook. It's a very good book, excellent book. Straight away, like they've got some 200, 300 recipes and you can straight away start taking those 
uh, code examples and you can start running them self contained recipes you've got so this would be a good uh, you know next step for you as well so try to look at more of these practical hands on books i would say this is probably the next step after you're comfortable with the orally and jeron book maybe you can read this book also it would be a good book for you to refer to yeah <clears throat> So here also he covers some deep learning later on. Yeah, I think yeah, it's the preview, right? But how come they're showing the whole book? <laughs> Maybe not, I guess. Yeah, I guess they're showing the whole book itself, right? Oh, sorry. Yeah, some pages are omitted. Yes, sorry. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, yeah, this is a good book. Can I ping this to you guys? I think. Okay, so it's been a long day. Thank you, guys. No other questions. We'll uh, break now. Thank you so much for your time, <laughs> and take care, all of you. It's been wonderful interacting with you. All the questions that came in. You guys must be tired now, <laughs> so let's uh, break. Thank you for your time, all of you. Take care, all of you. Thanks, uh, sir. Thank, thank, you, so thank, you, thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank you. I hope you. Really, it's a useful uh, session. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.